Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Montgomery County Council President Gabor Bodnos. Today is Tuesday, October 25th. We have a full day on uh, uh, today's council agenda, but we start with two important presentations. The first is a proclamation recognizing the 125th anniversary of Nature Forward by Council Member Friedson. Everybody here is who's here for that proclamation, please come forward. Good morning. It is a, a great morning here at the Montgomery County Council. I am so honored uh, to be able to welcome our uh, guests here. Uh, we have Nature Forward here, uh, formerly Audubon Naturalist Society, uh, and just so excited to celebrate 125 years of work in the community, inspiring so many to appreciate our natural surroundings. Our environment here in Montgomery County is what makes us who we are. It has uh, every type of landscape in Montgomery County and in District 1, from rural to suburban communities to urban uh, communities. And uh, it is uh, really incredible to be able to recognize an organization that has been here through so much of the land use change, the type of community change that we've had. But as all that community uh, has changed, our natural environment uh, has uh, remained and we've had an organization like this to make sure that we uh, understand and appreciate the uh, environment uh, in which we uh, occupy. Uh, Nature Forward occupies a very unique space by being in a populous metro region that is growing uh, and uh, occupying a physical presence in these areas with a lot of development, yet having expertise in native wildlife, clean water, and land protection policies and plays a leading role in protecting habitats and strengthening the connection between people and our community and our natural environment. Their goals of conservation, education, climate change mitigation, and advocacy are all ones that we value here at the Montgomery County Council. Uh, we are uh, really pleased to be able to join them, to partner with them, to work uh, with them, and today we're really pleased to be able to recognize uh, Nature Forward. We have uh, uh, Lisa, Denise, and Lisa uh, here with us uh, to uh, celebrate this uh, fantastic uh, occasion. And with that, I'd love to turn it over to Lisa to share a few words. Thank you, Councilmember Friedson and the entire council for this wonderful proclamation. Change is constant and it's exciting. And so as of last Thursday, we've gone from being Audubon Naturalist Society of the Central Atlantic States to being Nature Forward. And Nature Forward is an open invitation for everyone in Montgomery County to join us on our mission to protect our precious natural world. We wanna thank the County Council for being our partners in that good work. They have helped us make our headquarters nature sanctuary accessible to people of all abilities and just gave us support to open a new wheelchair accessible nature play space so children of all abilities can play together in nature. We look forward to working with the council on important environmental priorities including sustainable land use, climate mitigation, human health and access to nature, clean air, clean water, and retaining our biodiversity and habitats. It's been our pleasure to work with the council for 125 years, not while I was executive director though. <laughs> and we look forward to working together to protect the environment in Montgomery County for the future. Thank you for this important recognition and we are grateful to partner. And I'm Denise, a uh, conservation advocate for um, Nature Forward. And in, I'm so excited to receive this proclamation on behalf of Nature Forward today. Uh, I'm ANS, well, not ANS, Nature Forward <laughs> is uh, very excited to continue to work with the current council and the upcoming council on environmental policies that will take us forward into the county, into a more sustainable, equitable, um, county for to fight many um, changes that we're seeing like climate change. Um, so thank you all for this recognition and uh, looking forward 
to moving ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for those remarks. We're really excited. This is an organization that is firmly rooted in the past, uh, but charting towards the future, and we look forward to doing it together. I have a proclamation here from the County Council, uh, uh, Montgomery County Council, Maryland Proclamation, whereas Nature Forward is celebrating 125 years of mission-based work and the distinction of being the longest-running independent environmental organization in the Capital Region. First established in 1897 as the Audubon Society of the District of Columbia for the purpose of wild bird conservation. And whereas the organization's founders, many of whom were women who did not yet have the right to vote, worked in concert with other Audubon societies to secure passage of important bird conservation legislation, including the 1918 Migratory Bird Treaty Act that still protects birds to this day. And whereas in 1959, the organization became the Audubon Natural Society of the Central Atlantic States in recognition of its expanding role protecting nature throughout the capital region. Active members included the illustrious Rachel Carson, who lived in Silver Spring when she wrote Salient Spring, the groundbreaking book that resulted in the banning of DDT and helped to launch the modern environmental movement right here in Montgomery County, including the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency at the federal level. And whereas the organization and its members have played leadership roles in protecting our region's iconic natural spaces, including the CNO Canal, Huntley Meadows, Dyke Marsh, and Ten Mile Creek, and whereas headquartered since 1969 at Wood End Nature Sanctuary in Montgomery County, not far from where I live, more than 60,000 people visit the sanctuary each year to enjoy the accessible trails, forest, stream, pond, and meadow habitats, as well as for programs ranging from nature preschool to adult nature education and some of my own personal hikes. And whereas in 2022, Audubon Naturalist Society changed its name to Nature Forward to extend a broader welcome to people of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities in the capital region by hosting events such as Taking Nature Black and Naturally Latinos conferences. Nature Forward continues to focus on its vision of creating a larger and more diverse community of people who treasure our natural world and work together to preserve it. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby celebrates the 125th anniversary of Nature Forward, looking as good as ever, and congratulates the organization for its 125 years of nature mission-based work and its next chapter of stewardship and leadership under this new name and new banner. And be it further resolved that the County Council encourages Montgomery County residents to appreciate, understand, and protect nature with the lessons provided by Nature Forward and its allies. Presented on this 25th day of October in the year 2022, signed by myself, Andrew Friedson, County Council Member District 1, and Gabe Albernaz, Council President, on behalf of the entire County Council. Congratulations. new name threw me off <laughs> but I'm so excited and really appreciate all your work all right um, I believe oh perfect timing uh, we're gonna go on to uh, the next item on the agenda which is a proclamation recognizing the 50-year anniversary of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission by myself and Congressman Raskin
Well, uh, co come on up over here, Congressman Raskin. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, good morning, everyone. What a privilege and honor to be with all of you to recognize the 50-year anniversary of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, one of our federal government's most important agencies. And I'll start with a very quick story. Before my daughter, Alicia, who is now 14 years old, was born, uh, my wife and I spent a couple of months before she was born over a weekend baby-proofing the house. Uh, I got on all uh, on all you know hands and knees and to try to look through the house to see what the house would look like from her perspective and I drilled things into walls uh, and looked very closely uh, for through the Consumer Product Safety Commission's website as we purchased products and cribs and all of the things that first parents do to get ready for their new baby and the Consumer Product Safety Commission for 50 years now has been doing just that for all of us. Their job is uniquely important, especially now. And little known fact, they are located right here in Montgomery County, Maryland, with a headquarters in Bethesda with over 500 employees, as well as a testing facility in Rockville. So we are thrilled to have them here and call Montgomery County their home, where they do such important work. I'd now like to invite Congressman Raskin to come forward and say a few words as well. And I believe he has a citation. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. I've brought a congressional uh, citation, a certificate of special congressional recognition presented to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, which uh, we proudly host in Maryland's beautiful 8th Congressional District. And it is in recognition of your 50th anniversary and your unwavering commitment to protecting the public health and ensuring the safety of consumer products. So. Uh, we know that the CPSC serves Americans all over the country, uh, but as Councilman Albernaz emphasized, we are all here uh, especially proud of their work, and all of us are acutely aware of the service that they render to the American people every single day. So um, congratulations on your 50th anniversary. Thank you. All right. And we have a representative from Senator Vance Holland's office here as well who is going to present a citation. Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, I find it really hard to believe I was a freshman in college when the commission started. I had really hoped that either I was younger or the commission was much older. <laughs> but alas, no. <laughs> um, I'm pleased on behalf of Senator Chris Van Hollen to present uh, a Senate citation to um, the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission in celebration of your 50th anniversary in recognition of your tireless commitment to protecting lives and keeping families safe, with appreciation for its mission to address unreasonable risk of injury and its robust research into product-related illness and injury, and with gratitude for all that it does to make a difference in our nation. On behalf of Senator Chris Van Hollen, I present you, sir, <laughs> Why don't you come on up here and join me? <laughs> I feel kind of alone. <laughs> uh, with just an extra package. Well, thank you so much. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Sure. All right. <laughs> All right. And now I would like to uh, welcome uh, Chair Alexander Hohenserik to make some remarks on behalf of the Commission, and then I will read the Council's proclamation. Thank you. Thank you, President Albernaz, and thanks to the rest of the Council, and you know, special thanks to uh, Congressman Raskin, obviously Karen, who's representing Senator uh, Van Hollens, for both the proclamations and these, um, really, the, 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 the love and the, the affection that I'm feeling for the agency. Um, the CPSC. And you know, on behalf of the 500 employees, as you said, 500 plus employees of the CPSC, most of whom will work, as you pointed out, either in our headquarters in Bethesda or at the National Product Testing and Evaluation Center here, right here in Rockville. Uh, we greatly appreciate the, um, the the recognition that you're providing for the work that we do every day, and for the milestone that we have uh, experiencing with it, our 50th anniversary. When the CPSC was founded 50 years ago, you know, we faced, and Americans faced hazards that ranged from clothing ringers that were crushing the limbs of, of 
children, thousands of children every year to refrigerator entrapments where kids are suffocating uh, at far too great numbers. The agency has done a tremendous amount of work and had a number of successes. And, and luckily, modern consumers probably don't even think of those as potential hazards. But the work of product safety continues on, and the hazards that we are facing have evolved as well. So today, we're, we're addressing hazards like those related to button cell batteries, which small children are swallowing and spurring through their esophagus, causing grievous injuries and even death. You know, fortunately, with the help of Congress, which just passed a law this year to give us more authority with respect to button cell batteries, we're addressing these hazards. And we're also looking at new and evolving issues like shady manufacturers, most of them based overseas, who are selling on e-commerce platforms, defective products that are being shipped directly to consumers' homes. These are the kinds of issues that the people at CPSC are dealing with every day and every one of the CPSC's employees from our uh, scientists and engineers and investigators who research hazards to our attorneys who are taking the lead on enforcement to our communication staff who are dedicated and has their mission to get vital safety information out to the public. They all are focused every day on protecting consumers and getting these hazards out of our homes. So I've been a chair for just a little over a year, and it's been my honor to work with these dedicated professionals. And in that time, we've done things like over 200 recalls of products. We've assessed over $38 million in civil penalties against companies that have flouted our product safety laws. We've taken over 40,000 hazardous products off of e-commerce platforms and scan another 40,000 shipments for potentially hazardous products. So all in all, the work that we're doing is important for the American people. I look forward to building upon the work of the first 50 years, create a foundation for the next 50 years. And I once again thank the council. I thank House Raskin, thank Karen, Congress and Senator Van Hollen for this recognition, and I look forward to a continued partnership. All right. Thank you so much. And so I will now read the proclamation. Whereas on October 27, 1972, the Consumer Product Safety Act was enacted into law and signed by President Richard Nixon. This landmark piece of legislation established the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission known as CPSC. And whereas CPSC is an independent federal regulatory agency that has jurisdiction over thousands of consumer products. The agency was given authority to tackle consumer product hazards with a bipartisan board of five commissioners and was authorized to develop safety standards, pursue recalls, and ban certain products. And whereas for 50 years, CPSC has worked to save lives and keep families safe by addressing unreasonable risks of injury and deaths associated with consumer products and advancing public safety through seminal safety campaigns, including baby safety, pool safety, anchor it, and many others. And whereas CPSC is headquartered in Bethesda uh, with the National Product Testing and Evaluation Facility in Rockville, the agency's mission of public safety is carried out by approximately 540 dedicated personnel located here in Montgomery County, Maryland, across the United States, as far as Beijing, China. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby congratulates and celebrates the 50th anniversary of the Consumer Product Safety Commission and the invaluable impact that this federal agency has made in our community and across the nation to keep consumers and their families safe. Presented on this 25th day of October, signed by myself. Thank you so much. All right. Oh, oh, yeah, Councilmember Hucker. <laughs> Mr. President, uh, sorry, yeah, Councilmember Tom Hucker. Uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and Karen and Congressman, uh, thanks so much for being here. Uh, sorry to call an audible here. I was delayed getting here because I'm sharing a car with my wife. But I, I, I wanted to um, echo all of the thanks from our entire council. I used to work at the CPSC for three years, um, and it was a it was a fabulous experience. I worked on the implementation of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act and standing up the SaferProducts.gov database, our, our public-facing consumer database 
that all of you should be using when you are you know, shopping for your holiday presents or deciding what toys to uh, buy your children. We got that stood up uh, in an effective way on a, con on a congressionally mandated deadline. Um, and I learned so much about the agency and developed this appreciation that I just want you all to understand. With their 540 um, employees, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the shorthand we learned, is regulates the safety of everything in your house except what's in your driveway, because that's NHTSA, what's in your uh, medicine chest, because that's the FDA, and the refrigerator, because that's your, your, the USDA and FDA. Um, everything else in your house, the CPSC is responsible for, for keeping you from, from uh, un, unneeded hazards. Um, they punch very far above their weight. And with all due respect to our other federal agencies, they probably save more American lives per dollar than anywhere else because of the great, um, the small size and their broad, broad scope. So um, they have a tremendous workforce over in Bethesda. It was great to get uh, Senator Van Hollen there years ago into the opening of the lab, uh, the new lab in, in Rockville. And I just wanted to add my thanks uh, for everything you're doing. Thank you so much, Mr. President. That was great. That was very special. All right, let's take a picture. All right, uh, we are going to uh, recess for five minutes until 9.30, and then we will recommence. Thank you.
All right. Can we get a countdown? Good morning. We are live in five, four, three, two, one. All right. Good morning, everyone. We are going to resume our council session today. Uh, we have a number of items to get through and want to thank everybody who participated in the two proclamations this morning. The first, recognizing the 125th anniversary of Nature Forward, and the second, uh, the recognition of the 50th anniversary of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. Especially want to thank Congressman Raskin for joining us this morning uh, for his participation and Senator Van Hollen for issuing a citation through his office as well. We now move on to general business. Madam Clerk, do we have any agenda changes or announcements? Good morning. We have two additions to the consent calendar today. There's introduction of a special appropriation and CIP amendment for the Department of Transportation in the amount of $1,468,000 for the Farm Women's Market Parking Garage Project and introduction of a special appropriation and CIP amendment for the Department of Parks, $9,432,000 for Bethesda Lots 10 through 24. Also, action on a supplemental appropriation for MCPS technology modernization in the amount of $750,000 is scheduled for November 1st, 2022. The council received one petition from residents of Montgomery County opposing ZTA 22-01 antenna on existing structure use standards. That's all, Mr. President. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, we now have um, approval of the minutes from September 13th, 22nd, October 4th and the closed uh, sessions minutes from the 13th, 20th, and 22nd. Uh, I don't see any objections to those minutes and so they are approved among those here. We now move on to item number two, which is our district council session, our final district council session of this particular council. And we will now be taking up Thrive 2050 uh, and the action to adopt. Um, I want to begin with several recognitions because this has been a long road uh, and there have been a record number of work put into this document and a record number of engagement opportunities put into this document as well. Um, I want to begin by thanking Ms. Pam Dunn on behalf of all of my colleagues on the council. Um, she has spent endless hours over these last two years working on staff reports, attending meetings at the regional service centers, and working with consultants and constituents. Moreover, her work on Thrive overlap with the equally simple and non-controversial redistricting commission. Her work has been exceptional, providing us with the analysis and support the council needed to work through this extraordinarily uh, challenging and complex plan. And I'll just say a direct quote here from a resident who expressed a number of concerns regarding Thrive throughout this process, um, but wanted to share this note. Um, Please do tell Pam Dumb how grateful I am and many fellow advocates for her work. She has been put in many impossible positions, but she not only does her best, but reflects the best of what the council has to offer. She is the kind of public servant we all hope for. She is a superstar. And we certainly recognize that. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Elaine Bonner Tompkins um, as well and uh, the consulting team, uh, the uh, NS Per Green and Public Engagement Associates for their work. And um, also uh, do want to thank um, our colleagues um, in the planning department and the staff um, for their work collaboratively working with us as well um, in, in getting us to this point. Um, I, I shared this with some community activists recently and I was reflecting on this before driving here today. Uh, I was born in 1976 uh, in Gaithersburg and Montgomery County looked very different in 1976 than it does now. Uh, we have gone through a number of twists and turns but I have been proud of the evolution of this community in many different ways. And that did not happen by hap ha happenstance. The quality of life that all of us have grown accustomed to live with, the uh, thriving central business districts and areas around the county, all happened by design uh, through communities working together and previous general plans that got us to the point we are at today. But there is a practical reality that the general plan had not been updated in more than a generation and that it was time 
uh, to connect the dots among the various master plans and to provide a roadmap for the county moving forward. Um, this document, we did our best to help ensure that it was balanced, that it was not a one-size-fits-all document, but does lay a vision that the, that the next and future councils will be working on to adopt. This document was never going to be perfect, and I am not convinced that having stopped it and started all over again, we wouldn't have ended up in the same place or maybe even to the detriment of those concerned about the document now. So I feel strongly that we have um, done a lot of hard work to get us to this point and really appreciate all those that worked hard to get us here. So with that, I will turn it over to the chair of our Fed Committee to make some comments as well. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, Glad to be All right, here. I've, I've never actually had to use this before, <laughs> um, and I hope I don't have to use it today. I would just like to request that everyone please stay silent while we speak. Thank you. Thank you, Council President. Um, hopefully everyone can respect a civil dialogue. Um, I'm really glad to be here in this moment, and I would like to just express on behalf of my colleagues as well our first great appreciation to the planning team. Uh, and I know there's normally a, a, a much larger group of staffers who are here and, um, and others. So uh, this has been a significant, significant project. And we know that it has been consuming all 24 seven for years. And um, we're grateful for that effort. And you've produced something that is, it is a generational document. And we're, we're really grateful to that. So thank you for that effort. And Pam, um, and Pam and Glenn as well. But I think Pam's had. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say. I think Pam's had the tougher job here. <laughs> um, just knowing that you were at the helm from our staff perspective, uh, I, I was always confident we were gonna get through the tough spots. And um, you knew the right formulation. You knew the right questions to ask. You knew how to navigate very, very rough seas. So I'm grateful to that uh, for that. And um, I, I know we're here today now um, because you've been able to dissect, analyze, present, and provide for us the ability to make the final decisions as we, as we go through. So thank you for doing that. And Glenn, thanks too. Um, appreciate your work as always. Um, but uh, we're, we're, we're today going to act on a long, needed update to our general plan. And uh, this document has many critical goals, but promoting environmental sustainability and resiliency, climate, oh, no. climate uh, solutions, promoting equity oh, no. to achieve. Okay, this is, this is not the civil dialogue that you've been saying you're seeking, okay. Um, promoting social equity and social justice and promoting economic competitiveness. All right. Well, I'm sorry. You... Wow. I think that, uh... so um, those are the right goals. Those are the right goals. And not everyone has to agree. That's the nature of a democracy. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the nature of the system that we have. And um, I wish that our critics could engage in a more uh, respectful manner, but um, okay, so I will uh, <laughs> um, I, I just like to remind everybody in the audience to please be courteous. Uh, we are going to work through this, and then uh, we're going to move on. Thank you. Okay, so listen. It kind of doesn't matter too much what we say here the day is today. What we're doing is what matters. And uh, we are now going to proceed into taking action on this very important document. And we will uh, be happy about that conclusion. Right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dunn, any comments? Thank you. Good morning. Um, well, before we um, 
get to taking the vote. I just wanted to also thank my other council colleagues. Uh, Keith Lachenko worked on this, Linda McMillan, who's um, now retired, uh, Jean Smith, um, Selena Singleton. I uh, have many staff that helped with this, worked on this project. Um, and got us where we are today, not just Glenn and myself. So I wanted to thank them. Um, and I also wanted to turn it over to allow um, Ms. Stern here to make a few comments about planning and her staff. Tanya Stern, Acting Planning Director, for the record. I just wanted to share some very brief thanks uh, before you take action today on Thrive and Grooming 2050. First, I would like to thank the many community members who have been involved in this project over the last three years. We've heard a lot of different perspectives. Um, but it, this has really enriched the discussion and the deliberation on Thrive. Secondly, I would like to thank the Council for your very thoughtful uh, review of this document, the many ideas that you all have provided to make this a stronger plan for the future of our county. I also would like to give my uh, deep thanks to Ms. Dunn as well uh, for her uh, collaborative uh, uh, relationship working with the Planning Department on the many uh, edits and, and revisions to this document, uh, as well as to other council staff who have informed that process. And then lastly, I would like to give thanks and, thank, and share a thank you with our planning department staff. This really has been a department-wide effort over the last three plus years. We had uh, eight internal working groups who worked on this document that included over 60 staff from our department as well as the Parks Department. We also have a core team, including myself, uh, former planning director Gwen Wright, Cleet Ofsall, Carrie McCarthy, and Bridget Bruyere. But I wanted to really stress that this document was really informed by the expertise of many planning staff in our department, and I'm really proud of the work that we've done. And so at this point, I look forward to the council's action, and then after that, to get started on actually implementing a Thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for those comments. Councilmember Katz. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as has been no secret, I have had issues with Thrive 2050 uh, from the beginning. I've been supportive of the goals, but I'm concerned about how we get there. Let me say very clearly that since this plan has come to the Council, you, Mr. President, and the Planning, Housing, and Economic Development Committee, the Fed Committee, and Council staff, through tireless work, have done a very good job. In working through many of the issues, this plan is far from perfect. And might I add, no plan ever is. But hard work on it has been obvious. Since the beginning, when it was being worked on by the Planning Board during a pandemic, it was of great concern how the public was being engaged in the process. Any endeavor this all-encompassing is going to cause comment and concern, especially one that has 125 plus pages and volumes of comments. As was mentioned by me and others, how I was concerned that whenever Thrive was being discussed, it was continually mentioned that it does not change the zoning. But the entire statement was not being said, which was that although it did not change the zoning, zoning would need to be changed in order for Thrive to happen. That was corrected by this council. We also heard from many that their opinion was not being listened to and only those in agreement were being heard. As you might recall, I mentioned that during a presentation from the Planning Board that they had a slide that listed the many groups and organizations that were supportive that did not have any slides of those groups and organizations that had difficulties with the plan. This Council, along with Fed and staff, has continually worked to get us to today. It has been said many times that this is not a one-size-fits-all plan. I understand why it has been suggested that we should wait to vote on it, to wait for a new planning board and a new council. I realize the planning board and the next council will be the groups who will be working on this plan, even though they were not directly involved in writing it. They will be the groups who will be perfecting it. 
So in many ways, this document is the beginning, not the end. The goals are what we need, and we must pledge that on an individual basis for each area and neighborhood that we will work together with the public, with planning, and each other to truly thrive, to make certain that each neighborhood's quality of life is enhanced and all are listened to. This is not a perfect plan, nor will any plan ever be perfect, especially a 30-year plan. Many discussions and changes will take place. I candidly, at times, thought that it made sense to wait and that I would vote against this plan today. But after deep consideration and rereading the, the clean copy that's on our website, I'm going to vote for the plan, not because it is perfect, but because it is not. And by hard work, we're going to get to a better place. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much. All right. Um, colleagues, can I get a motion uh, in action to adopt this plan? So moved. moved by Second. Councilmember Reamer, seconded by Councilmember Fritz. And all those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Thank you all very much. We move on to the next item on the agenda, which is legislative day number 30, call of bills for final reading. Uh, the first bill we will be discussing is Bill 1721, the Police Community Informed Police Training. The Public Safety Committee recommends enactment with amendments. I would like to turn it over to the Chair of our Public Safety Committee, Councilmember Katz, to make some comments regarding this particular bill, and I believe Councilmember Jawando will likely want to make some comments as well. Councilmember Katz. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, as we begin, did I cut it? Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Mr. President. And as we begin, I'd like to, uh, to thank Ms. Wellens for her work on this packet as well. The bill, 1721, uh, was, co was uh, sponsored by Councilmember Juando and co-sponsored by Councilmember Reamer. It was introduced in May, uh, May 18th, uh, 2021. We had a public hearing on June 22nd. And an initial work session on the Public Safety Committee was held on November 15th, 2021. And a second work session was held on February 16th, 2022. At that time, the Montgomery County Police Department and Montgomery College provided updates regarding ongoing partnerships on police academy training. A third work session was held on October 10th at which time the committee recommended the bill uh, unanimously uh, set, uh, to be uh, enacted with, with uh, amendments. Um, the, it will require the police department to collaborate with local educational partners regarding police cadet recruitment and police training, and it will provide for the continuing education of police officers. If it meets with your approval, Mr. President, I know that Councilmember Juando does have something to say. I don't know whether Councilmember Reamer does. But, and then we could turn it over to Ms. Wellens to explain the, the amendments. Is Absolutely. That? Councilmember Juwando. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to uh, my good friend, seatmate, and chair of the Public Safety Committee, Councilmember Katz, and I really appreciate Councilmember Reamer uh, for his partnership, not just on this bill, but many bills in this arena, as well as my colleagues for all their support. I think this is a, uh, this is one I'm really, really proud of. It's, we, it, we introduced it about a year and a half ago, and a lot, have, a lot of work has been done uh, by the police department and by Montgomery College. I see some of our great folks here in the audience uh, to perfect and amend, and you'll hear about that later, this bill. But the core of it is, how do we make sure that our officers that are protecting and serving our residents have a really broad uh, interdisciplinary set of training so they understand the racial equity and social justice imperatives of our community, but also uh, are learning from non-police officers in a more academic setting and can practice that work. Uh, this will effectively add a week to the, at the end of the uh, training, of the 24-week training. Uh, it's been worked on in partnership. It will, the training will be conducted, in this case, uh, by Montgomery College, but this bill would allow it to be any institution of higher education going forward. Um, and and the, there are more robust partnerships in the works. Uh, it also uh, will focus on continuing education uh, for current police officers. 
And this is on very important topics uh, like de-escalation and communication skills and understanding the history of, the, of policing, all things that are needed to serve in a community as diverse uh, and robust as ours. Um, these are things that will build upon what's already happening in the academy, but put a capstone at the end of it and really help serve as a recruiting tool. Uh, when, when we introduced this bill, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Pollard in her absence, who was there when we uh, introduced this bill at Montgomery College, we noted that there are 700 students studying criminal justice at Montgomery College, give or take, every year. Many of those want to be in law enforcement. Uh, they reflect the diversity of our community, uh, most of them being from this county, most of them being black or brown or immigrant students. Uh, they're the exact students at a time when we have recruiting challenges, where we have challenges with uh, community trust and policing writ large, that we want to show that this is a way in to serve your community. And we think that this will be a direct pipeline uh, and that, that this bill and this training will help with that. So I'm very excited uh, about it and I want to thank the Public Safety Committee, all the members uh, for their work on it and the staff, Ms. Wellens, for her work as well and as well as my staff, Cecily Thorne and many others. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I really want to thank Councilmember Jawando for his leadership on this issue. Um, you know, this is one that builds off of a concept that we had uh, some time ago, which was building uh, a program through Montgomery College to have individuals that are really getting uh, the best training possible to make sure uh, that we're addressing the needs that we see in our community as a whole. Uh, understanding that we are not immune uh, to so many other surrounding jurisdictions, we have to do our part uh, to lead and to sh uh, shine an example uh, to other jurisdictions, not just in this region, but across the nation about how to do policing right. And it was working with Councilmember Jawando when it came to the discussion around our school resource officers and now our uh, community uh, uh, service officers, our CSOs, uh, who will undergo some of this training as well and, and be beneficiaries of this. Um, this is about ensuring uh, the understanding that as long as we have a need for police, that our police are actually going to be protecting and serving our community. And so I really want to thank uh, Councilmember Jawando again for uh, his leadership in terms of understanding the fact that, uh, you know, our police officers are ones that uh, are going to need to be in our communities, especially our communities of color, where we continue to see challenges, but at the same time does not mean that they deserve less treatment or to be preyed upon uh, or to be mistreated uh, or to violate law. Uh, the reality is, is that there's a great way to do it, uh, and it is with having this type of training. And so um, I, I really want to thank you, Councilmember Jawando, and members of the Public Safety Committee, uh, Councilmember Reamer, for his uh, co-sponsorship, and then also the community uh, who stuck with us in terms of understanding. Uh, and for all the mothers of the victims uh, of children and people that we've lost, uh, do understand that we're trying to do a better job. We understand that we have to weigh on both sides of the issue, uh, understanding that we have to treat those who commit crimes with respect uh, and ensure that we give them the support that's necessary, but at the same time, we have to protect those individuals uh, who are preyed upon in our community as well, uh, especially in our communities of color and of lower socioeconomic status, especially in our immigrant communities. Uh, and so from that standpoint, I think that this uh, fights a, a strong balance of ensuring that we have both in our communities. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wellens, I'll turn it over to you to uh, just walk us through the amendments. Oh, oh, sorry, my fault, my fault. Councilmember Reamer. Thank you, no problem. Um, thanks, I'm really pleased to be here today to vote on this bill and I want to thank Councilmember Jawando. I, I thought this bill was courageous and um, I think particularly it showed a council member who not only can tackle public safety, but do so in a manner that's informed by education policy. And I hope it's going to succeed in building a better culture. And I think that's this is one of many pieces we're trying to put in place to build a, a really great, positive, and effective public safety <clears throat> culture. So um, I'm grateful to the committee for carefully working through it and um, you know coming to a great place and thank you to everyone who uh, played a role. So I'm glad to be able to support this bill now. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wallens. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Public Safety Committee did unanimously recommend several amendments to Bill 1721. The amendments included uh, requiring the capstone program that um, Councilmember Jawanda described to require that to occur as part of the police academy as opposed to a prerequisite to the police academy as originally drafted. It was a prerequisite, but through the multiple work sessions working with the MCPD and the college, it was determined that it should be part of the police academy itself. Um, the committee also um, adopted an amendment to incorporate into the bill the requirements of the State Police Accountability Act uh, with respect to implicit bias testing that is required under the State Act. Uh, it, the committee adopted some clarifications of definitions that had been recommended by the Office of the County Attorney. And lastly, the committee voted to make the effective date of the bill the 181st day after the bill becomes law. The committee acknowledged that, of course, implementation of the required educational programs may begin at any time before the effective date. And in fact, there was extensive discussion that the college and MCPD are full steam ahead, already collaborating to move forward the programs. Thanks, Mr. President. Thank you. Just a quick point of privilege here. I really do also want to express my appreciation to Councilmember Jawando and the collaboration between Montgomery College and Montgomery County Police Department, who worked together um, once the foundation was set to bring forward an initiative that I think is going to be a game changer in many ways. So very, very excited about this one. Uh, all right. Uh, any other comments from colleagues? Not seeing anyone. We have a public safety uh, recommendation with amendments, so I believe we can go straight to the roll call vote on this. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Jawando? Yes. Mr. Jawando votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. Ms. Navarro? <laughs> Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. And Mr. Albernaz? Yes. Mr. Albernaz votes yes. All right, let the record show that passes unanimously, uh, which moves us on to Bill 2322, Personnel and Human Resources, Amount of Pension, Group G Members. Our Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee recommends enactment with amendments. I'll turn it over to the Chair of the GO Committee, uh, Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Friedson, who chaired that particular session because I was absent. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, Bill 2322, sponsored by the Council President at the request of the County Executive, was introduced on July 26, 2022, our last session before the August recess. Public hearing occurred on September 20th, 2022, and the GO Committee work session was held on October the 13th. Bill 2322 would increase the pension amount for Group G members by applying 5% of average final earnings for each year of credited service received for accumulated sick leave subject to a certain reduction amount and generally would revise county law regarding the pension at retirement. The county executive proposed Bill 2322 to implement a side letter collectively bargained between the executive and the IAFF on February the 15th, as you'll recall during last uh, budget session. Uh, the council briefly discussed the legislation uh, during the 2022 operating budget discussion, but at the time the council did not approve funding for the contemplated legislation since it hadn't been worked out. We didn't have a bill uh, before us. At the October 13th GEO committee work session, the committee discussed the effect the incentive will have on the use of sick leave and overtime, as well as the ongoing need to provide competitive benefits for our first responders. Uh, IAFF President Jeff Buttle informed the committee that he does not believe that due to the incentive, the bill will result in IAFF members coming to work sick instead of using sick leave. Uh, instead, President Buttle believes that IAFF members will seek alternatives to other allowed uses of sick leave. The assumption goes that if they use less sick leave, the county will have to backfill fewer positions by using overtime. This would result in savings in the long term, a potential reduction to the annual overtime budget. The committee voted uh, two to nothing, uh, Councilmember Katz and I, in support of the bill, noting the value of providing competitive benefits to first responders and acknowledging the legislation as a vehicle to implement a collectively bargained agreement. The committee also showed an interest in monitoring whether the bill has the desired effect on sick leave use and overtime. And so the committee supported an amendment to require the actuary in the regular study uh, uh, that they uh, do, that they uh, look specifically at this 
uh, issue and report uh, back to the council. Uh, I'll also note one of the uh, discussion points during the committee uh, was that the uh, executive did not have a plan for uh, the, the, how the cost of implementation would impact the next budget. The executive uh, determined that it was uh, unable to be known at this time and therefore would not be making any spending decisions. Uh, as a result, uh, there was a discussion during the committee that I think it's important for colleagues uh, to note that there was uh, some uh, frustration expressed uh, that the uh, executive should at least have some type of plan for the uh, fiscal impacts uh, for moving forward, and so we requested that they look into that uh, you know, during uh, the budget, but uh, this was an investment in our first responders who are doing life-saving work, uh, that we support that uh, investment, and that we'd just like to see some thought given to uh, what, if any, offsets would be required uh, as we move forward. So uh, with that, the uh, committee uh, strongly supported it and uh, look forward uh, to uh, colleague support as well. Thank you. Just like to recognize in the audience, Mr. Buttle is here. Appreciate your leadership, sir. Learned recently he is a big fan of 1980s music uh, and uh, appreciate that leadership. All right, uh, uh, Ms. Wellens, turn it over to you to make any comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I don't have anything to add. Thanks. Great. Uh, we have a committee recommendation here and no other comments from colleagues, so I believe we can go straight to the roll call vote. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Juwando? Yes. Mr. Juwando votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Albernos? Yes. Mr. Albernos votes yes. All right, let the record show that passes unanimous, unanimously as well, which takes us on to C, uh, Bill 2422, Streets and Roads. Transportation and Environment Commit, uh, Committee recommends approval with amendments. I'll turn it over to the chair of the TNE Committee, Councilmember Hucker. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, Dr. Orlin and Ms. Indu are joining us here, as well as our friends from Planning and DOT. Yep. Great. Welcome, everybody. Um, so, on uh, October 10th, the TNE Committee took up Bill 2422, and this bill is essentially a rewrite of Chapter 49, and it applies the 2021 Complete Streets Design Guide uh, to the design and construction of our roads and our road improvements. And I know you all have probably read uh, the, the 2021 Design Guide from cover to cover, but just as a reminder, um, it provides some policy and design guidance on the planning and design and operation of our county rights of way. Um, that the principles in there are all consistent with our climate commitments and they're consistent especially with our Vision Zero goals. Um, this bill updates and ratifies much of what we've already been doing and prioritizing um, for many, many years on our best designed rights of way. Um, the design was developed by the Department of Transportation, thank you, um, and the Planning Department. The goal is to create roadways that are designed and operated the way we want them, that they're safe, they're accessible, they're healthy, um, and they provide uh, transportation options for everybody, not just those of us who are privileged enough to own a car. Um, Bill 2422 seeks to update our traffic calming measurements. It includes definitions that are uh, we already approved in our bicycle master plan and uh, the uh, uh, pedestrian master plan, and it uh, sets minimum rights of way for the proposed street types. Uh, we had a lot of discussion of uh, rights of way with um, curb radius guidelines consistent with the com complete street guideline and maximum target speeds for all types of streets in the, uh, the county. The t and &E committee at this point rec unanimously recommends um, this bill with amendments, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Ndu and Dr. Orlin um, to share any additional information, including the amendments. Uh, good morning. Uh, yeah, this is uh, the, either the third or fourth major, depending on how you count it, uh, major change to the road construction code over the last 15 years. Um, uh, and this one has been building for the last three or four years, actually, and it's a joint effort really between the Department of Transportation and the Planning Board staff and the Planning Board. Uh, the, and the history of that time is, is on uh, uh, th uh, pages three and four of the packet. Um, the, what I'm going to do is just go through the changes that the t &E committee made to the bill that was um, uh, brought to us from the, from the county executive. 
And then uh, the next items after this in district council, this in the Jews is going to talk about the ZTA and the SRA, which are associated with this. But really, the, the main substance is in the Bill 2422. Uh, the first point on page five is that the, uh, the bill, as is, is introduced, uh, would um, require that the executive produce a method three regulation, which would provide a lot more detail uh, to the, than what is shown in this bill, and actually would do a long way to implement what is in the complete streets guide, because the guide itself is just that. It's just a guide. It doesn't have any legal basis. So what you need to do is actually follow with a regulation. The last time we went through this process was about 10 years ago, and there was an executive regulation, but it was method two. It was deemed important enough that it needed to come to the council, and the TNA committee agreed with that. So uh, one of the first changes that this would be a method two reg, not a method three. Um, the next issue has to do with uh, area types. Uh, the the um, uh, the bill identifies different street types, but also identifies that there are changes depending on what kind of area you're in. And the original bill su uh, suggested that be four areas, downtowns, town centers, rural areas, and suburban, which was everything that was in downtown, town centers, and, and rural. Uh, I'll touch this real quick, a little bit later, but uh, uh, the planning board recommended there be a fifth a type, area type called industrial, which is an area which is predominantly industrial zoned, industrially zoned, and the committee agreed with that. So there's really five areas. Um, but then the question was, well, what areas should fit into the category of downtowns and town centers? Uh, the planning, the, the bill identified uh, six areas as downtowns, Bethesda CBD, Friendship Heights, Silver Spring CBD, Wheaton CBD, uh, the White Flint sector plan area, and the White Flint 2 sector plan area. Um, Part of the discussion was, should White Flint 2 be really a downtown? And what the committee decided was uh, that the western part of it, which is over by Executive Boulevard and Old Georgetown Road, should be. But the part east of the railroad tracks, um, uh, over near uh, Lowen's Plaza, that area, should not be and should be identified as a town center instead. So that was, that was one change to the bill that the committee made. Uh, the planning board had actually recommended also three other areas to be added as downtown areas. Uh, the White Oak, um, uh, 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 basically, um, well, the White Oak growth area uh, um, along US along US 29, um, the Greater Seneca, uh, Great Seneca Science Corridor um, uh, Master Plan area, and uh, which is the one I'm the one I'm forgetting. Oh, Rock Spring Park. Sorry, the Rock Spring Park area, uh, and the committee agreed with that. Um, then there was discussion about the town center areas. And, and there, um, the, one of the ones that was added, as I mentioned, is the east side of White Flint 2, uh, but also lists all of the other town center areas which um, are <coughs> identified actually in the uh, master plan of, of uh, highways and transit, transitways. So they're now all listed as, as, um, in the bill as, uh, as amended as uh, town center areas. Um, Another change has to do with um, speed humps. Um, well, I'm, I'm sorry, skipping ahead. Another change has to do with uh, the authority to modify interim street type designations. Uh, the street type designations, whether it's an, uh, an area connector or, a, um, uh, or any of the other uh, many types of, uh, of streets that are in the bill, are really interim until a new master plan for each of those areas looks at these more closely and might make different determinations. Uh, now, the master plan of highways and transitways is going to be updated probably in two to three years, and there are also going to be other master plans that come forward even before then. Uh, the question is, uh, who can decide to, vi to vary from the standards uh, between now and that point? Should it be DOT or should it be the planning board or be, be a combination? Um, the bill would have DOT do that. Um, the uh, planning board had recommended that uh, this be done in concert with, uh, basically has to be agreed between the planning board and DOT. What the committee recommended was sort of a, a, a compromise on that. It recommends that, um, uh, that DOT determine this, but only after consultation with the planning board staff. And that was unanimous. Then in terms of minimum right-of-way, um, the, uh, there was actually just an error in the bill. Um, the, 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 the bill says minimum rights away include continuous features along a typical section and account for parking, drainage, and stormwater management. And it really should have said, and generally do not account for it, just the opposite of, of, what, uh, of what it was meant. And so the committee uh, recognized that change and uh, that correction and approved that. 
in terms of target speeds, what target speeds are are the, the speeds at which the policy is to try to get traffic to travel. Uh, it isn't necessarily the speed limit, although it usually is, but it's basically you take all of the policies that, uh, that we can muster, whether it's construction, design, operations, to try to get the speed to that point. And there are a lot of, of, of uh, in the bill, there's, there's specific recommendations to what the target speed is for every kind of road, and in some cases in different areas of the county uh, of, the, of that kind of road. Um, the committee agreed with, um, with almost all of those that were in the bill. Um, uh, the, the one where uh, they, they felt there should be a difference is that for uh, country roads, well, they're, they're comfortable with the country roads. It was for rustic and exceptional rustic roads. There was no uh, definition as to what the target sp speed should be, and the committee is recommending using 30 miles per hour as the target speed for that. Uh, otherwise, I had raised some issues, but the committee agreed with the bill um, as, to, um, as to what should be said, that, for example, a neighborhood connectors should have a maximum target speed of 20 miles per hour. These are the primary residential streets in the neighborhood, um, and that the target speed for area connectors used to be known as minor arterials uh, would be 25 miles per hour. Um, then there's a section having to do with sidewalk exemptions, and here, again, there was a difference between um, uh, DPS and, and park and planning over who has authority uh, on certain exemptions to building sidewalks. And uh, the Teeny Committee uh, recommends uh, replacing part of the bill to say the county must uh, identify the county must construct bikeways and sidewalks when it's constructing, reconstructing, or relocating a county road um, with a, a, a series of exceptions. Uh, the original bill had DPS issuing those exceptions, but DPS doesn't have authority over a capital project would be DOT, so the, this, this corrects that. Um, the, um, there's also, let's see, was there another? Yeah, this one here, right, thank you, that was a key one. Um, the planning board recommended an amendment that would not allow DPS to waive the requirement for a sidewalk or bikeway if it were a condition of a development approval. Um, and DPS opposed this, saying that they've always had that authority. And note that there's very few sidewalks or bikeways that it waves annually. I think, with, I think the number that came up was five um, uh, annually. Um, and they're here to correct that if, I'm, if, I, mis if I misremembered that. Um, the TNE committee agreed that DPS should have the final word on whether to waive such a requirement, but prior to a decision, it must consult with the planning staff. Uh, that, that's similar to the other um, provision, compromise, essentially, that that, that committee recommended earlier. Uh, furthermore, if the requirement is waived, the developer must make a payment in lieu that would help fund sidewalks and bikeways elsewhere. Uh, that's, that would be a, a new requirement in the bill. On speed humps, um, there were uh, s several changes to the speed hump program. The uh, program as it exists now in law uh, only allows speed humps uh, on pr what's now called primary residential streets or secondary residential streets if it meets the certain requirements that are in the, uh, in the bill. Uh, in the law and also in the follow-up executive regs. Uh, this bill would allow speed humps in uh, downtown and town center streets, as you often have a lot of pedestrian activity and the idea is to try to slow folks down to make it so that it's, it's more compatible amongst bikers, sidewalk, bikers, walkers, and, and cars. Um, the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee recommended that speed humps, however, also be allowed on rustic and exceptional rustic roads. Uh, the committee agreed with that. Um, and again, there need be follow-up executive regulations which would specify more about the requirements for, for doing that, but at least the law, the law would uh, allow that. One of the things that the committee did not touch on was what type of speed hump it is, and this sort of gets into the weeds, but the bill actually identifies three different types of speed humps, and uh, talking amongst ourselves, the staff, we felt that the category for that should be the third category, which is that they would be 22 feet wide. These are the humps that are more gentle. Uh, they you rise into like 10 feet of flat area and it drops again. So you can go a little faster on those than you would on a say a secondary street where it's just parabolic. Uh, and that the spacing uh, from a part should be 750 feet, which is wider than it would be in a neighborhood, um, and 300 feet from an intersection. So again, that's <coughs> not a specific committee recommendation, but I'm recommending that uh, we are all the staffs recommending that that's where the um, uh, this reference to rustic and rustic exception, rustic roads being eligible for speed humps should go. Um, and then um, 
there was also, also actually, I brought up a point at the table, if we're going to put speed humps on rustic roads, exceptional rustic roads, which we also want to make them eligible on country roads. Country roads are also local streets, if you will, in rural areas. The only difference between country roads and exceptional and rustic roads are that they don't have the, uh, the visual characteristics that exceptional and, rust, uh, and regular rustic roads have, but they're the same function. Um, there, the committee was split on it. Uh, Mr. Hucker and Mr. Glass recommended coming back to this issue when the rustic roads master plan comes to the council sometime next year, likely. It's, the staff draft is out now. It's going to go to public hearing in November, so it's, it's coming. Uh, and then if, if the council wanted to make a different uh, decision then, you could come back and change the law again. Mr. Reamer agreed with, with council staff that uh, country road should be included um, as a um, eligible for speed humps. Um, so that was a majority vote for t &A. Uh, and then there were proposed amendments to the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee uh, composition, and effectively what happened here was that the, uh, there's still a lot of division between the agricultural community and, the, and the, the residents of that area and some of the preservationists. And so the, the committee said well, we should take that issue up also when the Rustic Roads Master Plan comes back. It won't be part of the Master Plan. The composition of the committee is strictly a council decision. Uh, but it's a related issues, so it's something that you could decide then. If you make a different decision as to what the composition is as it stands today, you could do that and change the law for that too. Um, there were a couple of other um, changes the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee recommended. They were purely technical, uh, and the TNE Committee agreed with those. Those are at the bottom of page 12. And uh, that Perfect. sums up the um, changes the committee recommends. Thank you, Dr. Orland. We've got Vice President Glass followed by Councilmember Reamer in the queue. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Dr. Orland, for that thorough readout of uh, what was, was a really good conversation amongst everybody uh, here and, and, and the committee. Uh, and it was a robust conversation because we all share the goal of trying to make our roads safer for everybody. And that's essentially what this legislation is designed to do. Uh, clearly, there are disagreements about how to necessarily get there, but we all know the road, uh, the direction in which we want to go down. And, and this is getting us one step closer to that. And for, for broader context, we recognize that Montgomery County is a very diverse community, uh, geographically so. And I think the recognition of the four different types of areas from the downtown, town center, suburban, and country roads really spells out the differences that we have. And we agreed that there should be some parameters set for recognizing those differences but we also need to keep in check how fast people can go on those roads. And so whether it is 20 or 25 miles per hour, 30 or 35 miles per hour, uh, we want everyone to be mindful when they're using the, those roadways. And I also appreciate the, the conversation about sidewalks, particularly that this legislation now will require DPS and planning to coordinate a little bit more regarding the creation of more sidewalks, something that we all share uh, our interest in doing. And so uh, codifying that, recognizing that we, no one wants to build a sidewalk to nowhere, as came up in committee session. Uh, and hopefully this puts an end to that and puts so sidewalks where people need them, where people want them. And so uh, there are, are items that will come up in the months to come. We'll revisit those. Um, but I, I appreciate this, and I think it's a step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Council Vice President Glass. John Denver's song, Country Road, came to mind as you were speaking. Uh, that's one of my favorite songs. That's right. It's, it's, that's yes, it's, it's Clopper Road. Yes, Clopper Road. That's right. All right, uh, I've got Council Member Reamer followed by Council Member Rice. Great. Uh, we don't need to oh, sing is anymore. someone going to sing? No, I will definitely yield my time. Uh, <laughs> I'm just wanting to express my appreciation. I think it's a great, great uh, policy to put in place here. And I know it took a lot of careful work over many years. And, um, you know, I, I think it's uh, 
if, if it all came, if the, if the skirmish at the end that defines the final moment was the whether there could be a speed bump on a rustic road, you know, that means we did a great job on the actually difficult stuff. So uh, thank you for all the compromises that you worked through and, and the solutions that you came together around. I think this really represents the best in thinking about how we can continue to promote safety and, and uh, efficiency. Um, and I want to once again just uh, give a shout out because many years ago I tried very hard to get the county to fund this initiative and um, got it into several budgets, lost that funding with, uh, due to savings plans. Al Rashti, then director, identified a way to fund it from the department. And uh, I didn't recall at the time, but Director Conklin said that that was his perhaps first project at the county department. Um, and uh, wow, here you are as director, <laughs> you know, putting the finishing touches on it. Um, that's terrific. And uh, so, I, I, you know, it's a really important comprehensive amendment, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to support it. And uh, thanks to all my colleagues for their hard work on it and the committee. Thank you. Councilmember Rice. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I really want to thank uh, you, Mr. Conklin, and all of DOT because what's at stake is very, very serious. Um, the Councilmember Navarro and I were just talking about this. You know, um, there was a death in Germantown October 16th. There was a death in uh, Councilmember Navarro's district yesterday. Um, everything from children being hit uh, near Kingsview uh, to Montgomery Village and the like. There's so much at stake by doing this and getting it right. And so I really want to applaud uh, members of the T&E committee and DOT and our staff for coming together to make these kinds of changes that we know are going to end up saving lives and prevent and reduce injuries as a result. You know, when I think about Christina Morris Ward, uh, who died as we're coming up on uh, Halloween, a uh, young girl who was a Seneca Valley uh, High School student uh, who died trying to cross 118 going to school. There is so much that is involved and engaged in terms of the changes that we have made and the advances we have made from reducing speed limits to changing our crosswalks to timing to everything else to ensure the safety of our residents. And I don't want to speak for Councilmember Freetson in his district, he's seen it. It's where my wife's business is and she works there. And so I know all too well, we continue to hear about the risk. And so making these kinds of changes, it's actually disappointing to see our media uh, who doesn't report on these kinds of things. They'll report on all the accidents and everything that happens, but the changes that we're making, you know, as I saw them here for Thrive, but they're not here for this because this is the true change. This is the work that answers those stories that they put on every night about the death of individuals and about the risk that it poses to our constituents. This is the work. This is the work that the council and executive staff and our county executive do each and every day to make sure that we're trying to deliver a better community for our residents. And so, I just want to say thank you and applaud you all for your efforts and tell you that our community appreciates it as well. As the voice of those in my district, and I know I speak for every council member here uh, in all of our districts who depend on safe roadways, safe walkways, safe bikeways to be able to get to and from work and all kinds of other things that they're doing, this is incredibly important work. So thank you. Great job. Well done. Thank you. Councilmember Friedson. Yeah, thank you. I just want to echo uh, much of uh, what Councilmember Rice just said. I, I was uh, on Thursday uh, with Dan Langenkamp uh, on River Road, and uh, it was the exactly uh, within an hour uh, and eight weeks uh, from when Sarah Langenkamp was riding her bicycle home from an open house at their new elementary school, and she was struck and killed. And she was largely struck and killed because there's an inadequate bike lane there. There's a number of entrances uh, in what is effectively a formerly industrial area on River Road that is reimagining itself as an urban area and uh, the land use pattern doesn't reflect the current community that lives there. And this is unfortunately true. And 
intersections and communities throughout Montgomery County. Um, we laid flowers on the ghost bike there. He announced uh, on November 19th, uh, on Saturday at 10 a.m., they're doing a ride for your life with Trek Bicycles uh, and with the Washington Area uh, Bicycle Association, WABA uh, of D.C., uh, to advocate for full funding of transportation funding that has not been funded up to this point uh, for infrastructure changes like the ones we're talking about here uh, to support local governments around uh, the country for $200 million. So I, I wanted to note that. I appreciate uh, that uh, this uh, was raised, but the, the challenges at that particular area are not unique. The tragedy that this husband and father uh, is facing is not unique. Uh, the, 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 the issue that we have is, you know, we have a woman who she and her husband were evacuated from Ukraine for their safety, came to Bethesda, Maryland in Montgomery County, and she was killed riding her bike on the way home from school. So I, I you know, appreciate it. I, I wasn't intending to, to mention that here until Councilmember Rice, you know, centered us on why we're talking about these things. And I just think it's I important uh, as we, you know, have these uh, discussions uh, that, you know, we talk about life and death issues and complete streets are life and death issues. In fact, it might be the most important life and death issue that we deal with on this council at a policy level, at an engineering level. And I just think it's really important. So I, I want to acknowledge that I, you know for you know there's a somber reason why we're here uh, but it's important to remind us uh, for uh, why we're here and what we're doing uh, we can prevent the next tragedies to avoid all of us from having to join vigils having to join family members who've lost loved ones on our street and uh, councilmember navarro's district a daughter lost both of her parents within a short period of time at you know the same area trying to ride the bus because of how dangerous uh, some of our roadways are. So this is critical work, it's life-saving work. I really appreciate the tremendous efforts of staff and all of the work that the TNE committee did and uh, appreciate the indulgence of colleagues. Thank you, that was well said. Um, I think we are um, ready to move on. No, sorry. Sorry, one more point. I neg neglected to mention this. Um, yesterday, planning staff did a thorough read through of the uh, bill again, and they found about a half a dozen corrections that needed to be made. And I've circulated. You'll have it on your desk, and I, we recommend that be incorpor they be incorporated in the bill. They're all strictly just mistakes that need to be changed. Without objection, I think we accept those recommendations. So, because that is an amendment to the current bill, I need a motion to uh, move this forward. Moved by Councilmember Hawker, seconded by Councilmember Rice. Now we can go on to the roll call vote. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Jawando? Yes. Mr. Jawando votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friesen votes yes. Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. And Mr. Albernos? Yes. Mr. Albernos votes yes. All right, let the record show that passes unanimously as well. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, we now move on to item number four, which is our district council session. And before we start, I just want to recognize this is the final district council session of this council. And I know I speak on behalf of all of my colleagues and thanking you, Ms. Nadu, uh, for doing some pretty heavy lifting these last couple of years. Uh, your work over the last 21 months and especially during the marathon of zoning work that occurs at the end of a term. You worked on 19 ZTAs this year and 10 alone this fall and you have done a remarkable job translating complex zoning issues into language that those of us not only on the council but in our community can understand and digest and process. So we thank you for your leadership and that takes us to the first item which is a work session in action on Zoning Text Amendment 2210, Streets and Roads. The T&E Committee recommends approval with amendments. I'll turn it over to the Chair of the T&E Committee to tee this one up. Councilman Moore Harper. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, yes, I uh, second heartily everything you said about Ms. Nadu. Uh, she's been invaluable and, and a great help to the committee in particular. Um, ZTA 2210 and SRA 2210 are both connected to Bill 2422. Um, the T&E committee recommends uh, those with amendments. Um, ZTA 
2210 makes technical changes to help implement Bill 2422 and SRA 2201 supports the complete streets design by amending Chapter 50 of the code that focuses on the roads. Um, SRA 2201 aligns with Bill 2422 by requiring um, a pedestrian focus on roads and intersections that we're all quite committed to. So let me turn it over to Ms. Ndu for, um, to allow her to dive deeper into the packet. Thank you. So first I'll do ZTA 2210. So the TNE committee recommended approval of this ZTA with three amendments that were proposed by the planning board. Uh, so first, three ZTAs passed since the introduction of this ZTA. So the first amendment is for any ZTAs that passed that referenced a roadway, um, going in and changing that reference from arterial or higher classified roadway to area connector or higher classification roadway. Um, those ZTAs were the ZTA 2202, our bio ZTA, 2205, our sign rewrite, and then 2206, the historic site. So just making sure what most of the CTA does is just updating road names. The second recommendation made by the t &E committee was amending the definition of road to include all of the new road types. And then the last uh, amendment recommended by the t &E committee for this CTA is the zoning ordinance uses street and road interchangeably, but does not actually define street. So the recommendation is to put in a definition for street that says C definition of road. So those are the three amendments for ZTA 2210. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any questions or comments from colleagues. And so I think we can go straight to the roll call vote for this. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Jawando? Yes. Mr. Jawando votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Albernas? Yes. Mr. Albernas votes yes. All right, let the record show that passes unanimously as well. That moves on us to uh, item B, work session in action, subdivision regulation amendment SRA 2201 streets and roads. Once again, the T&E committee recommends with approval for approval with amendments. Uh, Chair Hucker? Uh, the uh, elements in, in uh, uh, sub SRA 2201 are, I think, covered in my previous remarks, so I'll, if it's okay, turn it over to Ms. Ndu. So the two amendments for SRA 2201, which amends our subdivision chapter, uh, first, Tandy recommended um, adding new, well, so new language was added that discussed protected crossings. So one of the amendments is to make sure to include a definition for protected crossings and then clarify all the different um, types of protected intersections. So that's the first amendment. And then the second is the SRA talks about when a neighborhood street or neighborhood yield street can be a private road. And there were two different conditions and it used the word and, it should be an or because you don't need to meet both of those conditions. So those are the two amendments for SRA 2201. Great, I don't see any other questions or comments from colleagues and so we can move on to the roll call vote on this as well. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Jawando? Yes. Mr. Jawando votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Albanos? Yes. Mr. Albanos votes yes. All right, let the record show that passes unanimously as well, which takes us on to item C. This is Action Zoning Text Amendment 2201. Antenna on an existing structure use standards. Fetty Committee recommends approval with amendments. I'll turn it over to Chairman Reamer. All right. Thank you. Um, well, this zoning text amendment continues the County Council's recent work to make sure that residents in Montgomery County have access to the latest in wireless technology. Wireless technology and all of the many benefits that it brings for our economy, for our educational program, for our healthcare systems. Uh, and so many more purposes. Uh, that technology relies upon a complex network of physical infrastructure that is wired and is wireless. And we all have elements of that infrastructure around us at all times in our living rooms or our dining rooms with our, wire, our wireless routers, uh, with our televisions, our, our devices. Um, it's, it's ubiquitous. And we need to allow for that infrastructure to be where it 
also belongs, which is on our streets. Uh, and the purpose of this zoning text amendment is to create a, a rational set of zoning rules to allow for the deployment where this technology needs to be, which is on utility poles and in other areas in the right of way. Um, at, its, at its root, this uh, zoning text amendment is about harmonizing the rules for wireless attachments to existing poles with the rules that we established last year for new towers. So we're trying to establish the same set of rules for existing poles as we did for creating new poles uh, or new, uh, for exist, you know, attaching an antenna to an existing pole. Um, as it stands, our county's rules incentivize new towers more than attaching to existing poles. Uh, and that's just not ideal. It runs really against what we want as a community to get the most efficient deployment, the least duplicative deployment, uh, the least obtrusive deployment. So um, that's what this zoning text amendment seeks to accomplish. And I'm grateful to my colleagues at the Fed Committee. This has certainly been a thankless task, um, but Council Members Juwando and Friedson appreciate your, your work through it, uh, thoughtful deliberations. And Council Member Friedson introduced some thoughtful amendments that ensure that the anti-proliferation and other preferential placement protections that we put in our previous uh, zoning text amendment for new poles would also apply to attaching antennas to existing uh, utility poles. So um, we, we embrace that uh, set of changes. Um, and uh, we, we still have work to do. The county has to adopt a master licensing agreement, which the executive has uh, failed to do. Um, and, you know, we, we need to have that happen. But uh, I hope at least as far as a zoning matter is concerned that for, for at least a little while, this can close the book on this chapter. We've been working on this for six and a half years. Six and a half years. That was 2016 is when the first zoning text amendment was proposed. Uh, and what we ended up doing was dividing that zoning text amendment into multiple pieces. Uh, and this is the third significant piece in that process. So um, meanwhile, other jurisdictions in the region have long since adopted these rules. And we are now the outlier on the wrong side of a divide. And it's not where we want to be. It's not what made this county great. So. With that, I hope we can uh, proceed now to, to finally adopting this zoning text amendment. And back to you, Mr. Council President. All right, I see no questions or comments from colleagues. Oh, Councilmember Hucker. Um, just as I said during the work session, uh, since my other employer filed an amicus brief uh, in the successful lawsuit against the FCC on this matter, I should recuse myself from the vote. Thank you. So noted. Can I have one more, please? Councilmember Reamer. Just before I pass it back, I, I again want to thank Ms. Nadu, uh, who has been really um, incredibly helpful as our guide through very, very complex issues. And not just on this zoning text amendment, but on the blizzard of zoning text amendments that you have worked on. And uh, I, I knew there were many times over the summer where others were probably having fun and you were. Uh, <laughs> working away on um, on some very technical matters and you were able to bring those to us for our deliberations and explain them in ways that are very conducive to having a fruitful dialogue and uh, allowing us to make decisions and I'm, I'm grateful to you for that so great work thank you thank you all right uh, let's move on so no other questions or comments from colleagues we have a committee recommendation we can go straight to the roll call vote mr. Katz no Mr. Katz votes no. Mr. Jawando? Yes. Mr. Jawando votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Mr. Hucker recused himself. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Albernaz? Yes. Mr. Albernaz votes yes. All right, let the record show that passes with uh, seven in favor, one opposed, and one abstention. All right, we move on to the next item on the agenda, which is an interview of Mr. Josh Waters.
All right. Hey, Mr. Waters, thank you for coming to us uh, today. We appreciate you being here. We will now turn it over to Mr. Madalino to make some opening comments. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, members, I'm joined today by not only our nominee for um, the Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget, but our outstanding Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Um, the uh, uh, Management and Budget, um, uh, Jenny Bryant. So, Josh has been with us in the county government for six years. Prior to that, he worked for the Department of Legislative Services. So, I'm pretty sure that Council Member Hucker and maybe even Council Member Rice got to work with um, Mr. Waters when he staffed the, that against him. the Appropriations <laughs> Committee. So I had, the, of course, the good fortune to work with him um, on budget matters at the state, uh, but he was smartly hired by my OMB predecessor, Ms. Hughes, um, before I joined the county government. Um, he has been an outstanding analyst, moved up um, through management in the department, and has been functioning in an acting capacity uh, in this role. Uh, the deputy director is, in some ways, some of you may remember the operating budget manager um, for, the, for the department. Josh has done an outstanding job in, in helping Ms. Bryant and the county executive over the last two years um, in that role. He's also doing um, great work, um, working with Dave Gottesman and the county stat team which as you know was relocated into OMB specifically to help with results-based budgeting. Um, and you're gonna hear more about the vision that um, Ms. Bryant and Mr. Waters have for, for including that and growing that ov over time. Um, again, I wanna say, uh, I know this is the end of the term, but um, some of the internal functions that have been vacant, we're trying to make sure um, we have the opportunity to fill them now um, so that obviously with the budget, which is already starting now, um, we have the team in place um, so that the next um, executive and council can move quickly um, in um, formulating the budget. So um, I'm very pleased to recommend Mr. Waters for this position. Um, he is a graduate of a school that usually does really well in football. Um, so he's used to only having to count to five, really, because that's where they are, but they're not in the top five right now. So just wanted to point that out too as an Alabama native. So I know, I know, he pointed out to me yesterday, where's Syracuse in the rankings and um, at an all time high, but still much lower than the University of Alabama. But um, we are fortunate to attract people like um, Josh Waters to the Montgomery County government and to have him stay as part of the career. The county executive is honored to nominate him for this position. Thank you very much. Just a point of privilege here, just as Ms. Bryant was once the OMB analyst for the Department of Recreation, Mr. Waters was also the OMB analyst for the Department of Recreation. So I had the privilege and honor of working with both of them in that capacity and can speak in the first hand about the support and guidance they provide to executive branch agencies and to us on the council. So uh, Mr. Waters, I've got uh, five questions I'm going to ask you and then uh, my colleagues will then have the opportunity to ask questions themselves after I'm done. Uh, but if you could first begin by please describing to us your understanding of this position of Deputy Director of Results and what you will focus on as you transition from serving in this position uh, in an acting capacity to serving in a permanent role. First of all, thank you, Council President, and I would also like to thank the County Executive and the Chief Administrative Officer uh, for nominating me for this position to the Deputy Director for Results and for the Council for inviting me here today to interview for the position. Um, so this is an appointed, not married position that reports directly to the uh, Director of the Office of Management and Budget and serves as the acting director in her absence. Um, it, the central focus, as the CAO said, is the directing the planning and development of the county executive's recommended operating budget and six-year public services program. Uh, some of the main duties include establishing the county's overall fiscal planning guidelines and budget guidelines for executive branch departments uh, and managing the internal review of those operating budget requests. It also includes directing the development of all supplemental appropriations, budget amendments, and savings plan reductions, managing the budgetary relationship between the executive branch departments, outside agencies, other levels of government, and the county council, uh, ensuring the performance metrics are used in budget decision meetings, ensuring that racial equity and social justice analyses are brought to the forefront during budget discussions and budget decision meetings, 
overseeing OMB's involvement in the collective bargaining process, as well as supervising a team of fiscal and policy analysts. And I just want to say that OMB has a great team of analysts and staff that work for us. The county is very lucky uh, for the team that we have. And as you know, I've been acting in this role for a little over a year now. Some of the things that I'll be focusing on in this transition is to make OMB analyses more useful to policymakers. I'm working to include a more outcomes-focused approach in budgeting, which I'll speak to a little later on. In addition, I've been directing the redesigning of our fiscal impact statements to make them more useful to the county council and make the analyses more comprehensive instead of the current format that we're using. And then finally, communication between the executive and legislative branches on the budget is critical. And so I've set recurring check-in meetings with my counterpart and the council staff to ensure that information is shared more freely and frequently. Perfect, thank you. Uh, the second question is, how is this position different from other supervisory roles you have had? And what in your prior experience at OMB makes you the best candidate to take on these new responsibilities? Thank you. So I've been a supervisor at OMB for a little over three years now. What makes this position different than the other supervisory positions that I've had is the broader impact and the management of the policy and budget direction and coordination. Uh, to that end, I will say that the entirety of my career has been focused on the formulation, analysis, and implementation of sound fiscal and budgeting policies. And I think my experience makes me uniquely qualified for this position. Uh, as Rich said, the first nine years of my career, I was an analyst for the Department of Legislative Services, the nonpartisan staffing agency for the General Assembly. I started out as a policy analyst that analyzed the fiscal and policy implications of bills that were introduced by Council Members Hucker and Rice. Um, and then I moved up to be the lead analyst for the Appropriations Committee, where I managed the budget process uh, for the House Appropriations Committee. Um, and during this time, I advised the committee on the best ways to balance the state's $35 plus billion dollar budget during the depths of the Great Recession and immediately following the Great Recession. Um, and I ensured that the priorities of both the House Appropriations Committee and the House of Delegates were captured in the budget document that was produced by the House. Uh, after my time at DLS, I had the opportunity to work for a project called the Results First Project at the Pew Charitable Trusts in DC. Uh, the project worked with states to implement an innovative approach to budgeting uh, that more and fully incorporated robust evidence into the budget and policy decision-making processes to ensure that public money was being spent only on those things that were proven to work. In this role, I was the lead consultant and advisor to six states around the country in implementing that innovative approach to budgeting. Following my time at Pew, I decided I wanted to get back into the public sector. Um, so I had the opportunity to come work for OMB. Jennifer Hughes dragged me away from Pew um, to come work for OMB. And so I began um, with Montgomery County as a budget analyst, working on budgets like the Department of Health and Human Services. I worked with recreation. I worked on the Positive Youth Development Initiative, on the Seniors Initiative. I worked on community grants, uh, managing the, the county executive's community grants process for several years. Um, I also had the opportunity to serve as the OMB representative on the Collaboration Council alongside Council Member Friedson and Council President Albernaz. Um, in September 2019, I became OMB's Special Project Manager, where I had also had the opportunity to supervise a team of fiscal and policy analysts as they did their work. Um, and I served on, as the OMB representative on the, the county's Contract Review Committee, reviewing those contracts and procurement actions that were non-competitively bid. And I coordinated the interdepartmental efforts to track the, the spending of the $183 million the county received under the Coronavirus Relief Fund through the CARES Act. Um, for the past year, as Rich said, I've served as the acting deputy director for results, where I managed the planning and development of the county executive's FY23 uh, proposed operating budget. Thank you very much. Uh, third question is, how do you envision this position Enhancing racial equity priorities in the budget process overall, as well as specifically within budget decision making. Sure. Uh, reducing and eliminating racial disparities is one of the primary goals of this executive and the council. And the deputy director for results plays a central role in making sure that happens through the budget process. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the, the collaboration between the council and the executive on implementing these racial equity and social justice priorities for the council and creating the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice, particularly the work of Council Member Navarro and her work with the county executive at getting this under, underway. Um, I see this position as enhancing racial equity priorities in three specific ways. OMB recruitment efforts, close coordination with the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice, and broadening access to the budget process. It's important that OMB reflect the community that we serve and, uh, and to bring a more comprehensive perspective to our budget analyses. 
the director has uh, placed in me the charge of, uh, of our recruitment efforts for OMB analysts. And over the past few months, we've recruited and filled, I'm happy to say, all of our vacant analyst positions, which represented a third of our analyst complement. Um, in doing so, I identified and worked with a consultant to make sure that our job ad was customized and placed on job boards and search tools that targeted racial and ethnic minority populations so that we could have the broadest applicant pool possible. In addition, we used our own professional networks to seek out applicants from all backgrounds. I will say this effort has resulted in probably our most successful recruitment effort ever. Again, we filled a third of our positions within the span of about five months, and we have a very diverse applicant pool and candidate pool that came in. Uh, building on lessons learned from prior years, we've worked with the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice to restructure the tool that we use to collect the information in a more consistent manner. We've also worked with OREsj to ensure that there are training opportunities for departments uh, so that the information that we collect is more consistent and more valuable for policymakers to make better informed decisions. Starting with the FY24 budget development, Office of Racial Equity Analyses will be performed directly in the county's budgeting system that OMB uses to make recommendations for the executive, meaning that our budget analysts will have access to all the information that departments provide regarding those racial equity questions. And the Office of Racial Equity will be using our budgeting system to do their analyses and when we print the packets out for the executive to use, that information will be used in all department head meetings, all county executive meetings, alongside the budget analyses that the fiscal and policy analysts produce. It's also critical to OMB that the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice has a seat at the table for all internal budget meetings, whether that be internal OMB meetings, meetings with the department heads, and meetings with the county executive to make sure that information is not only discussed but bought, brought to the forefront as those budget decisions are being made. And then finally, we want to ensure that all residents have access to the budget process. And it's critical that we also allow access to the budget process to those who speak languages other than English. Um, last year's Spanish language forum that we implemented was highly successful. We're using that as a model and we're working on a plan to expand that approach to other languages this year, whether that be through targeted budget forums for specific speakers of languages or through enhanced uh, translation services at those budget forums. Thank you very much. Just two more questions. Um, and then uh, the chair of our government operations committee is in the queue. Uh, what role will you have in performance measurement uh, work at OMB? How will you coordinate with the county stat office and the office of legislative oversight? Sure. As, as the chief administrative officer said, the county executive merged county stat in with OMB a few years ago so that performance analytics were more fully incorporated into the budget process. Um, this position is critical to that effort. Drawing on my previous experience with the county, working with the Pew Charitable Trust on the Results First initiative, and my experience at the state level, uh, we are working to incorporate more robust evidence into the budget process. For administrative departments, this is something we'll be starting this year. This is going to be including benchmarking what the county is doing with similar jurisdictions, both regionally and nationally, including the structure of the departments, processes that they use to undertake their work, and examining and comparing outcome and output metrics. For policy areas, this is going to include, at first, compiling a, a comprehensive list, a comprehensive inventory of the programs that we implement in those program areas, looking at budgeting and performance metrics, population served, programs goal, program goals, whether the program has been robustly evaluated either locally here in the county or a similar program has been evaluated nationally and using that information to determine if that's a good program to be implemented here. Um, I mean, there's a wealth of information that's available nationally through databases on program evaluations that have been conducted, thousands of programs. Um, and where a program evaluation hasn't taken place, we'll be working to assess whether there's value in conducting a program evaluation here at the county level. Um, as far as working with county stat, as we go through budget analysis, I work every day with a county stat manager to make sure that the metrics that we are tracking for each department are the appropriate metrics to track for the policymakers to make the best informed decisions. I'm also ensuring that each internal budget meeting that we have has active participation from the county stat manager and the county stat analyst assigned to that department so that metrics and outcomes play a more central role in the budget decision making process. Uh, where performance issues have been identified, the budget analyst, the county stat analyst, 
and the department personnel are going to be working together to analyze the, the issue fully and develop solutions for consideration to put forth uh, to the executive. I think there's more opportunity for OLO and OMB to work more collaboratively. OLO analyses have been critical in identifying where programmatic and process improvements can be made. Um, I think one of the best examples that I can think of is the OLO analysis on the community grants process from several years ago, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, this was particularly helpful in identifying improvements that could be made to the community grants process. Um, as I'm sure several council members re uh, remember, Council, uh, council President Albernaz and Council Member Navarro in particular, uh, we worked with council staff and council partners on implementing reforms to the community grants process as a result of this OLO report, holding forums with nonprofit partners to make sure their feedback was incorporated into that uh, reform, um, and, and taking into account the goals of the policymakers. It took a few years to implement, uh, but many of the reforms that were outlined in the OLO report that were discovered through OMB and council staff collaboration have now been implemented. And thankfully, we have an Office of Grants Management now that started this past uh, July, uh, thanks to the efforts of the council and the executive on, on bringing these reforms to fruition. And that's the kind of collaboration that needs to take place between OLO, OMB, and council staff. Thank you very much. Uh, final question for me is, are there any potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? No. Great. I will now turn it over to the chair of our Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee, Chairman Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. And um, so amazing, amazing uh, opportunity uh, that lies ahead. Uh, really, truly uh, very, very pleased with um, listening to the very detailed answers, especially around the racial equity and social justice piece. I, I find it that a lot of times when we ask that question, there's a kind of canned response about we will work with the Office of Equity. You know, and, um, but not a lot of very specific details around what, what that would look like and why. Mm -hmm. um, and so just a couple of, of um, thoughts uh, and then a question for you. Um, obviously, one of the things that I thought was very exciting when the executive uh, la you know, last term, this term, at the beginning of this term, when they talk, you know, when he talked about this issue of results oriented, of even zero-based budgeting or something like that. And it was very exciting because, you know, the county executive had been here as a council member and for so many sessions we would talk about how a lot of the programs um, seemed to have the same impact because they had not been really looked at for a different design, mm -hmm. even though the county's needs and the population had shifted, right? And, you know, I am aware that this is a very difficult thing to do. I mean, when you have established particular programs and initiatives for so long, you tend to enhance them, but you don't tend sometimes to evaluate and say, we have to do away with this one and we need to choose that one. Um, but that is work that is going to be absolutely necessary now more than ever because um, when we look at all of the different data points whether you know it's school system or whether it's just what just happened with the pandemic when we look at our uh, diverse communities uh, which have become more and more diverse with more complex needs we're not ever going to have enough money to just keep enhancing what we're doing we have got to pause analyze evaluate and then say Perhaps this has yielded better results. Let's scale that up. So I'm wondering, you know, and, and by the way, that is why the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act was so important because it's a tool, right? It's a tool to do that analysis in a structural way. Um, so I am wondering how will you begin to tackle that? I am absolutely cognizant that this is not an overnight endeavor, right? Um, but a necessary one. And so I heard you, you know, sort of start to articulate that. But just curious, um, how do you see that as, as a, you know, as, as a evident sort of shift? And will you be looking at issues of scalability um, that is informed uh, with whatever we have been able to identify as getting the best results and therefore, um, you know, should be scalable? Because I think that that's also another blind spot is that we, we love to add a lot of different initiatives, but they're not scaled to a point where we can begin to see a shift and, you know, uh, uh, the needle moving in any way. Um, so just curious about, how, you know, you describe a little bit of how you're going to start that process, but just a little bit more on that. 
Sure, and thank you for the question. So one of the key components to doing that is really getting at the program assessment piece of this. Taking a look, doing a comprehensive inventory of what we are currently doing. Looking at who we are serving, how many people we are serving with each program. Are there outcomes that are measured for each program? But it's also looking, as you said on the other side, what is the universe of the population that the program could serve but aren't reaching, right? It's looking for those low-cost options, if those low-cost options exist, to make a bigger impact. It's looking at, you know what, and it's, it's going to be very difficult to do, if there's evidence where a program is not working, it's going to be critical to move the funds, perhaps from that program that is not working, to a program that's serving a similar population that is working. It's very reminiscent of the work that I did when I was a consultant at Pew, where I worked with states around the country to do this. Uh, one of the examples that comes to my mind is working with the state of Colorado, where they were looking at uh, programs that address recidivism in their prison population and looking at whether, like, say, a cognitive behavioral therapy was working versus a, a, a jobs program that was working. When we brought this information to the policymakers and showed them this is the return on the dollar that you are receiving for this program through either avoided costs or the benefits from implementing a certain program versus this other program, the decision became clearer for the policymaker to see and became more defensible for the policymaker to make that decision to say, you know what, we only have this much money to spend this year. This program is shown to make a bigger impact. Let's move the funds from this program to this program. And it worked. But you have to have the evidence to back that up. You have to have the evidence in order to make the argument to the policymakers. And you have to give the argument to the policymakers to make to their constituents who are asking for perhaps the other program that isn't as effective to explain to the, pol to explain to the constituents, to explain to the residents, this is the best allocation of the resources based on the funds that we have available. And so that's going to be critical to provide that information to the policymakers so they can make that informed decision. I really appreciate uh, that answer, um, and it's it's really exciting. I think that you know, as someone who's about to leave, um, that has been one of I think the biggest challenges for me personally. Because, as we know, every single time, especially during the budget process, the people that come and fill this room are not necessarily the people that are out there really needing a lot of you know, particular services or initiatives or things of that nature because A, they may not know how to participate, but B, a lot of times folks are just so busy and don't even know that they have that option. And therefore, it's up to the policymakers, right, to make those decisions and to make sure that the services are implemented. But it's also a fiscal policy responsibility issue in the sense that if we're not able to really understand what is going to help these communities in that way, we are literally just spending money on programs that maybe are not having the impact. So it hits so many different policy goals. Uh, and unless it's baked in, in, on your side, as you have been describing, it's going to be very difficult for the county to, to make that shift. You know, I have oftentimes in conversations asked, you know, okay, so what is that number, right? Because during budget, right, every time every agency is hitting you and saying, we need more money, we need more money. And I'm just like, what, what is that tipping point? Right? So for the school system, is it, I don't know, $6 billion so that we can say, yay, we can now address the academic achievement gap? Is it $12 billion? What, there doesn't seem to be necessarily, uh, and I don't blame folks, but it's because we haven't had a systemic way in, in being able to show that, hey, what we did 30 years ago and continue to fund is no longer having that impact. Now we have to switch to this other best practice, right? Um, I'll close with this. I think that the Por Nuestra Salud y Bienestar in the African American Health Program during COVID-19 was a really good example of how we can save money because it was targeted. We worked with the community providers, but we were able to avert what obviously was on the trajectory of being an extreme disaster in these communities, which then would have cost a lot more money to remediate, right? I mean, we're talking about lives. Um, so I think that we have these bright spots that could be used almost as case studies um, so that, as you were saying, policymakers, decision makers then have the tools and the cover to be able to say, no, we got to go in this direction and not. Um, so I, I think this position is so critical. Uh, and I hope that, you know, it will be 
implemented at such fidelity that the new council um, will be able then to shift a little bit of the way that uh, budgets are, are, are considered and also the way that they're adopted and then the impact in the community. So thank you so much. Thank you. I've got uh, Councilmember Rice followed by Councilmember Hooker. I'm just going to be very quick. Uh, Mr. Waters, uh, you've always been well respected. I remember in my time in the General Assembly, I'm sure that uh, uh, Mr. Radolino remembers this as well when it came to DLS and when it came to fiscal notes. Oftentimes, delegates and senators would argue uh, with those particular representatives, but there were uh, certain people who we avoided. You were one of those. And so uh, that certainly spoke to uh, <laughs> the level of uh, uh, due diligence that you put in in your analysis. And so just wanted to chime in on that. I did want to uh, touch on something that Councilmember Navarro brought up that I think is incredibly important as we move forward, especially when it comes to results because results aren't always quantifiable. And I'll give you a great example, uh, Conservation Corps. And when uh, former County Executive Leggett was here, there was talk about eliminating Conservation Corps because of the significant expense. Councilmember Navarro knows this all too well. And I was one of the ones that championed efforts to try and make sure that we retain this program because although it didn't necessarily have the data, the stories themselves about what it is that we were able to accomplish spoke for themselves. And I know that Councilmember Katz knows this all too well as we had a conversation the other day about the cost of people continuing to go in and out of our uh, criminal justice system and being incarcerated and those costs continue to rise. And so from that standpoint, the investment that we make, especially when it comes to young people, is incredibly important even when it is exorbitantly expensive. Uh, because every life that we have here deserves to be saved. Uh, and if we can do that and intervene, it is incredibly important for us here in Montgomery County. I believe that is what makes us unique. And so I just wanted to impart to you that as we continue with the analysis that I think is incredibly important, we also have to incorporate the heart as a part of it as well. And understanding and knowing that it's not always just about the numbers, but it is about understanding what the difference is going to be made in our community and the impact that it has on those lives. And so uh, just, just really want to say that I know you're the right person to make those kinds of decisions. Uh, I believe uh, that, that, that certainly your breadth of experience as well as your knowledge and understanding of who we are as a county um, will certainly shine through in those efforts, but just wanted to make sure that I lifted that up. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Got Councilmember Hucker followed by Councilmember Friedson. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, Josh, very glad you're here today, and kudos to the county executive for selecting you for this. Um, I didn't know you were with the Results First Initiative. That's really interesting. And did you mention recidivism at one point? Yeah, um, right. I remember writing about that work when I was at the Center for American Progress and how states like Texas with limited budgets counterintuitively were leading the country on reducing their prison populations. Um, that, that was really important work that Pew was doing. I didn't realize that you were part of it. Um, uh, I loved everything you said about um, assessing the effectiveness of programs and the almost routine need to um, reallocate funds from one program that isn't meeting goals or delivering the outcomes that you anticipated to another one. Um, can you give us examples of where you've done that already in this? I think that might be helpful to everybody. Sure, and drawing on the experience that, uh, that I had working for Pew, Colorado probably was, of the states, I, I worked with mm -hmm. six states across the country. Some were more successful at doing this than others. Colorado was probably the my success story working with Pew. Um, Colorado had a glut of funds coming in from the, uh, the taxes that they imposed on, on, on legalized cannabis. They were looking for ways to spend those funds. Um, and so one of the things that we helped them do is, is implement an econometric model where we worked with uh, a university out of, the, out of Washington who had an econometric model that they put forward that worked with states to show in real terms what the avoided cost would be, what the imputed avoided cost would be for implementing some of these things. And so one of the things that we did was, was put more money, I believe, into the cognitive behavioral therapy programs that were offered in the, in the prison system, because that showed if you work with inmates on those, on those specific um, skill sets, that they will not come back into the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important that we do highlight those programs that aren't performing and highlight those programs where there is performance going on. 
my time at Pew, I believe they moved, uh, I'll have to think back, they moved several millions of dollars between separate, several programs. This was a collaborative effort between the governor's office, the management and budget office, and then the, the, the Colorado General Assembly. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's a great example. Uh, I think this work, I, I, I could talk about it all day. I think it's really important. Inertia is really powerful in like all areas of our lives. And, um, you know, we form personal habits, um, good and bad, and government forms habits too. And constantly assessing um, the, the, the value of the investments we're making in all these programs and whether they leave, uh, leave, live up to our aspirations um, is, is just so important. So I'm really glad you're there. We set all kinds of very lofty goals here, whether it's housing or our climate emergency or our vision zero. But the real hard part is behind the scenes um, in, in actually meeting them and steering a giant government to, um, to hit those outcomes. So it's exactly the type of work I think that we need much more of. Um, and we need good people doing it. And um, uh, I think it's critical to retaining public confidence. There's never enough of that. And people uh, think we do this sort of too much performative stuff and they don't see the amazing um, work that's done to assess programs and steer dollars to where they're really needed and away from where they're not, not living up to our expectations. So anyway, very confident in your skills, have loved working with you in two arenas. Um, and grateful to the county exec for uh, moving your nomination forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Friedson. Thank you. I could uh, think of uh, six and a half billion reasons why we're all glad you're uh, taking on this role. Appreciate the chief administrative officer and the county executive and director uh, for uh, putting you forward. We've worked together in a couple different capacities, as you have uh, noted, and uh, every time we have worked together, I've seen the seriousness that you take your work, the talent uh, that you have as an al as an analyst, and uh, really respect and appreciate that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to supporting you, uh, and I know uh, uh, we all have seen you in this role, and there's no question uh, that you're up for uh, this uh, this task. Uh, just my only question really is, you know, you've been around for a while. You have been part of certain changes that have happened. You've been part of certain changes that have not happened, uh, that have been uh, adjusted or uh, abandoned uh, for, you know, different reasons, uh, which is okay too. Uh, just curious, you, you've been around long enough to see what works and what doesn't work. Are there things related to our budget and our budget process specifically that you'd like to work on changing and that you intend to advocate to change? Um, so you don't have to implement major process reforms to bring in outcomes budgeting or outcomes focused budgeting into the budget process. I mean really outcomes budgeting is, is five simple steps. You gotta do program assessment. You gotta take a look at what you're doing. You gotta look at budget development, incorporating what works into the budget process. After that, you have to do implementation oversight. You've gotta make sure that the programs that you are implementing are being implemented with fidelity to the model that they were designed to uh, be implemented for, targeting those populations. You also have to monitor outcomes. You have to make sure that the programs are hitting their goals that you set for them through the budget development process. And then finally, there's the program evaluation piece. You gotta make sure that if an evaluation hasn't been done elsewhere, you've got to set aside some money. And this is going to be a hard decision to make. The council and the executive will need to set aside money to do a program evaluation to make sure that what we're doing is a wise investment in public dollars. That's not a sweeping reform of the budget process. You can incorporate any of that into, the, into the, what you're doing. It's an approach. And the way we're talking about it at OMB is this is an approach to move the needle. It's not a sweeping reform. What we're doing right now, we're incorporating a lot of these things right now into our budget development process. County stat is monitoring outcomes. We do have oversight. Could it be more robust? We can do it. There's always room for improvement in the running of any government. But implementation oversight is something that, that is critical to this process. Budget development and the collaboration between the council and the executive on that budget development process and allocating those funds and communicating about what works and what doesn't work is going to be critical to that process. So I don't see sweeping reforms of the budget process that need to be made. I see it as an approach. And I see that, um, as you said, we have six and a half billion reasons to do it. That's a, that's a large ship to turn. 
and it's going to take some time. You have to go and you have to find those success stories where you can implement this process, this approach. Have those success stories that you can tell other people. Create those champions. And when you do, other people will come along. And then you'll start seeing a more concerted turn into that approach. Yeah, to your point, it's so big, though, that even a small change across the enterprise has a huge difference. The joke I've heard is you change the cost of butter on a cruise ship and you can save a lot of money. You know, you wouldn't think that changing, you know, the cost of a very small item or soap or, you know, you, you name it. But, you know, it's such a big enterprise that th th that small change is important. The one thing I would urge you and, and, and request of the three of you here uh, is to be as intentional and serious as you are talking about in the evaluation side of budgeting as we are on the front end of budgeting. Because I do feel the challenge that we have faced in recent years is we put forward well-intended programs and sometimes we have to step up to an emergency and I think we have done a good job working together with all of its bumps along the way in an unprecedented uh, moment to step up to that. But uh, we don't frequently have offsets. We don't frequently make the choices. We don't acknowledge those choices up front and say, okay, we are going to prioritize this, but it's going to be at the expense of that. And to me, that is really going to be what we're going to have to start doing. We've been in a unique moment that has allowed us to do some things that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to do and have never been able to do. But ultimately, we're going to get back to the idea that if you spend a dollar for something, you, by definition, are not able to spend a dollar for something else. And we have to prove with, you know, to each other, but most importantly to the public, that we're spending their dollars in the most appropriate way. We, we have, you know, because of federal funding and support and state support, you know, we've been able to just add funding, which is great. But you know, I think that those days are limited, and I think we all have to be a little bit more serious and intentional. And so I, I hope we can pair really well those five points that you made about the evaluation on the back end to make sure that once we invest money that we're doing it wisely, but that we also do it in the front end to make sure that we're doing the appropriate offsets and prioritizing the way that we need. But I'm, I'm sure you'll do that and look forward to working together uh, with you and, and really appreciate it and look forward to supporting you. Thank you. Councilman Jawanda. Thank you. Uh, good to see everybody and Ms. Bryant and Ms. Mandeleno. Good to see you, sir. Congratulations on the uh, impending appointment. Uh, I want to just bring up two, two questions, comments, kind of hybrids. Yeah. Um, you mentioned collaboration with us on assessing and developing programs and the budget, right? And it's something that we've been talking about too. I personally have thought a lot about our ability to actually have the time to conduct oversight over the budget, right? Because it's a joint process, right? The executive, you all have the, the responsibility and the great staff to work with the agencies to pull together the budget, present it, and then we take time to go through it. And, you know, several time I've, times to this morning I've heard, which I'm very heartened to hear, you like, we have to work together, we have to collaborate, we have to make sure that we're assessing together. Um, I'm curious of your ideas about how we can better work with you to conduct that oversight and to review those assessments, even outside of the normal budget process. Um, do you have thoughts on that? Sure. Um, so you guys have fantastic staff over here, both in your county the council central staff as well as the OLO staff. Um, you know, as we go through the budget or as we go through the year and implementing programs, and, and OMB does constant spending monitoring, expenditure monitoring from departments and working with departments about what are you spending money on? Is this working? Is that not working? If there are issues that can be identified, OMB may not be the best source to do a comprehensive program evaluation. That may lay with, say, your Office of Legislative Oversight. That communication between the executive branch and the, and the council on that could be very key to that. As we identify issues, we could communicate that to OLO. Um, we could also, as the, the legislative branch is doing its, its work in oversight, council staff, OLO staff identify issues. The communication with staff is going to be key. So I think not just communication with the policymakers, it's actually bolstering that communication on the staff level to make sure that, that that collegiality and camaraderie exists on both sides of the street with our staff. So that information is shared. So if that information is shared, our budget analyst, as they're going through the budget 
for that department each year, if we know there are issues that maybe council has heard of or council staff has heard of, if those are shared with us, then we can take that information, examine it through the budget process as well to make sure that gets to the executive as he's making his, his, his final decisions on the recommended budget. So that's some of the collaboration that I think could be useful for both the county executive and the county council. Yeah, I appreciate that and I agree. Uh, you know, we're also thinking about are there ways we can structure our work as a body and as committees uh, as we enter a new phase of the council to have more time and attention out even outside of the budget process to have those intentional conversations. You know, I'm often, I think a lot of us are like, well, we, we're in the budget, we got to get through it. We can't go through every issue. Um, and so I would just ask as we're figuring that out, uh, work that we can work with you all to be open and willing if those when those opportunities arise to have you come prepared to talk about those things, even if they're outside of the budget process. Because I think there's just, it's such a big operation as we talked about. It's such a big government. We're trying to do so much. Um, I think that will be helpful, particularly with having a majority of the council new um, as we head into the budget next year. Um, so more to come on that, but I just wanted to plant the seed and, and say that we're thinking about it. And I'd, I'd ask you to continue to think about ways that we can structurally create places and moments in time for us to check in on things. And I think this, what you suggested with staff is absolutely, that happens, but more of it can happen. But there may be, I think there's other things we can do too, uh, whether it be how we structure our committees and, and what the schedules are and, and more to come on that. But um, the second thing I wanted to mention, and I really appreciated your answer on the racial equity and social justice question. I appreciate Councilmember Navarro's calling that out in particular and others. Uh, I, I just want to really emphasize, and I know you know this, but it, it's hard to remember because of the way we function traditionally in this field. You know, you mentioned that uh, the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice will be in the room or at the table, I think is what you said, to, to call out when we need to stay on track. That's an immense amount of pressure. <laughs> and uh, I, I know because I've been in the room, felt that way. We recently had some conversations about that as the, as the responsible party to call out when things are going astray. So the much, as much front end work as we can do to say it's everyone's responsibility to call out, um, not just the racial equity and social justice team, which is mm -hmm. a small team managing a very big enterprise focused on training and the like. I think it's important that we have that mindset that it's everyone's job to come, and you, and you did say this, to come prepared with that analysis already, but also to question and question and question again, because we're working against a system that wasn't set up to do that. And I just think it's important to remember that. Absolutely, and I will, I will say that we are requiring all of our analysts to go through the racial equity and social justice training with the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice. Uh, when the office was initially set up, um, Director Bryant had special sessions where the director of OREsj came in and held specific trainings for OMB analysts where we were um, discussing openly those issues where she had exercises for us to discuss and kind of communicate what our experiences have been in order to bring that conversation up to the forefront um, we've had some turnover since then we likely need to revisit doing something like that again with the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice so that our entire office can come together and discuss those issues uh, collectively so we are all on the same page and how to best implement that those priorities of the council and the executive I appreciate it thank you and congratulations look forward to voting for you thank you thank you um, Ms. Bryant did you want to say anything in comment well I think Josh has said it all um, he's been my colleague for the last several years and he even worked as an analyst on one of my teams so I had the opportunity to manage him while he was doing a lot of great work with the portfolio assignments that he had and I just want to echo some of the things that he said. I have been talking about program evaluation for a while now and was excited when the county executive merged county stat with OMB so that we could begin to look at, to examine what that would look like. I think that is going to be so critically important to resource allocation in the future because we don't have unlimited resources. And we may have some economic downturns that we have to be ready for, but we also have a large segment of our population and residents who have needs that are complex, that are changing every day. And how do we address that if we are not looking at what we're doing and whether or not the residents are receiving the best bang for their buck? It is important work. Um, you know, and just the, the 
basis of getting to that work and having the whole organization understand how critical it is. I know everybody's very protective of the resources that they have, but um, there has to be some understanding that we are a collective government and we're delivering services as a collective government. So there may be some areas where we'll have to do some puts and takes and we will have to do the hard work and make recommendations that may not be popular. Um, but it is our job and it's up to us to make sure that we are protecting and we are stewards of the public's funds, we are stewards of the public's trust, and that we are doing things that work and not just doing them because for lack of a better word, there are special interest groups who are interested in it, but we're doing f things that are for the better good of all residents in the county. And that's just not residents. You know, it translates into our business culture. It translates into everything that the county does to help the community to move forward. So I'm excited about Josh taking on this role permanently. He has been a great asset to our office. He's been an excellent mentor, not just to our, our team of analysts, but to the management team. I mean, that has been remarkable, and I'm really happy to see it and, you know, hope that he, I know that he will continue in the same vein that he has been in over the last year. But, you know, we have some work to do as a community, as a government, as a legislative branch, as an executive branch. We have work to do, and I'm excited about moving all of that forward and making sure that we can be impactful in the work that we perform. So, I'm excited. Wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you so much, um, Mr. Waters, for your public service and for coming forward today, and uh, we look forward to taking up the formal vote soon. All right, we move on to item six on the agenda, which is interview of um, an interview of three candidates for our Police Advisory Commission. I'd like to welcome forward Ms. Christy Daphnis, Christina Delane, and Rudolfo Rudy uh, Dunasa. Thank you all three of you for your willingness to serve. Um, we greatly appreciate the work of the Police Advisory Commission, which has advised us in the development of a number of policies, one of which we passed this morning. Uh, and so we, we do very much appreciate your work, particularly now. So um, I have two questions, and then colleagues will have the opportunity to follow up with questions of their own. Um, and uh, we're going to do this in alphabetical order and then reverse back uh, as we go through the second question. So I'll start with you, Ms. Daphnis. The first question is, please briefly describe why you want to become a member of the Policing Advisory Commission. And given your background and experience, what do you hope to accomplish as a member? Great, thank you so much. Um, and before I jump into that, I did just have to say um, thanks for passing 2422 this morning on complete streets. I know it's a totally separate topic, but just had to say that. Um, and I apologize, I don't have notes. I have a phone because I forgot them at home, but uh, I have my notes here anyway. Um, given my educational background, work experience, and extensive community involvement, I feel like I'm really uniquely qualified to serve on this commission. Uh, to provide valuable inputs and systemic connections between the work being done between MCPD, other county agencies, and also within the community. First, uh, though many of you are probably not aware, I actually have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice uh, from the oldest and one of the most respected schools of criminal justice in the country, Michigan State University. Uh, my interdisciplinary coursework as an undergrad and my year plus of student employment at the state of Michigan's uh, training academy for the Department of Corrections <laughs> really helped me to realize at a young, helped me to realize at a young age that the majority of our crime problems are often related to inadequate social structures and, and services. Um, this ultimately uh, led me to attend graduate school at the University of Michigan for public health. Um, with, a, with an interest in addressing crime and societal problems at their root. Uh, this undergraduate and graduate school training led me to a postgraduate presidential management fellowship at the U.S. Department of Justice, where I worked for nearly two years to ensure that the Federal Bureau of Prisons had the funding necessary to provide adequate and safe prison facilities, programming, and constitutionally mandated standards of care. Um, while this work, obviously is on the back end and didn't 
necessarily provide the social justice outcomes I had idealized. At the least, it hopefully at least provided some level of dignity to those individuals who found themselves caught up in the system. Following this experience, my job professionally has required me to analyze and recommend policies, programs, legislation, and regulations on a whole host of, of topics, which at times has included law enforcement and national security matters at the federal level. Um, as I mentioned, I'm very engaged in my community. Um, I won't go through the whole list of things that I've done, but it has included you know, starting a civic association, uh, serving on the county's COVID response uh, committee, and uh, an advocate for youth um, through my leadership of a Girl Scout troop of nearly 40 girls for the past eight years, and really serving our children and our families. Um, in our schools as an MCC PTA delegate and, and at times a cluster coordinator for the past eight years. And finally, as most of you know me as a member of the county's pedestrian, bike, and traffic safety advisory committee. Um, I've been on that committee since 2013. My time is up. <laughs> time to pass the baton to someone else as I've been sharing it for the past several of those years. Uh, I think these qualifications skim the surface, but don't really get at the why, for why I've submitted uh, an application to be on this commission. Um, while it might sound cliche, uh, I really would like to serve my community and use my skills in the best way possible. And part of my why is really as the wife uh, to a black immigrant husband and as a mother, mother to black children, especially my son, Sebastian, some of you have met, he's nine. And data shows that young black men have more encounters with police than their non-black peers with worse outcomes. As Sebastian enters his teenage years and young adult years, I want him to live in a county where we're diligent about fairness and equity and where we use data, transparency, and systemic change and culture to drive better behaviors and outcomes. And you asked, um, I think, what some of the priorities would be if I were to be appointed to this commission, and I have a few. First, I would want to help the chair of the commission to chart a course that creates synergy between this commission and the mandated police accountability board and charging committee. Second, I would want to work with the commission to assess the progress we've made in the past year toward fulfilling the recommendations in the effective law enforcement for all review and to help advise the council on the next steps with that uh, using both this report as well as evolving academic research. Um, Third, I'd work with the commissioners and chair to do outreach to other boards, committees, and commissions, particularly those that relate to social services and provision of mental health services. The better position we are as a county to provide the best social services possible, the lower crime will be, and the police will be better able to do their, to do their job, to, um, <laughs> to really focus on issues that they're best positioned to address, not to pull double duty as a pseudo counselor or social worker which are highly trained and licensed occupations. Um, fourth, I'd lean on my, um, my eight plus years as a delegate and cluster coordinator uh, to the countywide council PTAs to help monitor the implementation of the Community Engagement Officer 2.0 MOU to keep schools safe with the appropriate police response to major incidents while also uh, protecting our children of color from uh, any unnecessary trauma. Um, I would draw upon my professional experience leading broad strategic workforce management issues to help advise the council on matters related to recruiting and retaining a diverse workforce. And last but not least, I would work with the commission to maintain attention to the important requirements of the county's 2020 bill, 2720, the use of force policy law including care, careful review of the annual report data, other data that may be available to the commission, and generally uh, the overall transparency of MCPD. While there's often a risk that data can be misinterpreted or misused, um, transparency and open data is really one key way to help bolster trust and to maintain accountability against persistent biases and injustices, not just in Montgomery County, but um, in our society as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Delane, same question. Briefly describe why you want to become a member of the Policing Advisory Commission, given your background and experience, and what do you hope to accomplish as a member? Right. Thank you. And uh, press the button. Yeah, got it. Thank you very much. And the honor is mine. I appreciate you all taking the time and to interview me for this. Um, well, I originally 
thought to enter the legal field myself when I was teaching. So I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill as a teaching fellow in North Carolina. I became a teacher. I taught eighth grade um, in the 13th poorest congressional district in the United States at that time. Um, so you can imagine the demographics, a lot of black and brown children, a lot of poor children. It was quite the experience and I realized how limited I was. There were a lot of legal concerns and issues there. A lot of my students were having way too many encounters with law enforcement in general um, or with the legal community for reasons outside of their control, family, home situations, multitude of reasons. So I decided to uh, continue my education and attend law school. Um, many years later, I went to the University of the District of Columbia, um, attended law school there. I am now an attorney and I realized that Wow, so I, I worked in the community. I needed to extend a little more in order to really touch all the tentacles that are necessary. Um, so I become a lawyer and then I realized, wow, I'm still not really in the depths of everywhere I need to be. I'm not touching and feeling and grasping everything. All of this all works together. Um, so this opportunity to be on this commission in particular allows me to put what the community work I have done and seen and experienced and things that are still going on that need to be addressed in the legal community where I'm able to represent those when they reach the point that they need me. Um, how can I prevent them for, from getting to me? How can I help them more effectively um, once they reach me? Well, it all starts with the charge, the arrest, the police, and, but you can't just start there because if I look back, all of that's more successful if they're in touch with the community. So it has brought me full circle to this commission to say, well, I have the experience, I have the knowledge, I have the community involvement, but I don't have my hands on the police at all. Um, I have my own experiences with the police on both sides, good and equally as bad. And how do I walk up to a police and trust them? Or how do they walk up to me and trust me? We don't want to get to the nitty gritty if we, if we, if we, can, we won't get to the nitty gritty if we continue just looking at the larger policies. There's historical reasons as to why it is indoctrinated into the policing of any community um, that there are color lines, there are economic lines. I mean, there were times that Germans were policing the Irish and the Irish were policing the Poles. And then all turned whenever African Americans, brown people came into the picture, all the European descent came together and said, now we'll police those brown people. And that's where it starts. We have to admit that it's in there. It's from the beginning and from the start of it. Once we get down to the dirt of it, dig that up, clean that up, recognize and acknowledge that. We can get to real work. I think on the commission, um, acknowledging those things and working from those points um, and that experience and that viewpoint will be a fresh look on the commission as well. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Um, Mr. Lunassen. Good morning. <clears throat> and thank you for, um, for, for taking your time. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be sitting with my, with my counterparts here. They're, they seem very uh, uh, experienced and I'm, I'm hoping that I can provide some uh, different perspective. Uh, so, um, I am a retired uh, Army uh, military officer. I served uh, 24 years in the Army, and we moved here to Montgomery County uh, in 2017. Um, and, and you ask, why do I want to be a member of uh, this council or this commission? It's because I want to continue to serve, right? Uh, that's something that I've done. Uh, my most of my adult life is is served my country and now that we've decided to move here to Montgomery County um, I want to continue to serve this community and and make things better um, you know uh, I've lived uh, across the United States uh, Northeast Midwest out west down south I've lived um, throughout the world I lived in Asia I lived in Germany uh, I've been uh, to many, many different places, um, and policing is done uh, differently, I think, everywhere, right? But in the United States, it's, it's done at the local level, and I always wonder, uh, you know, the longest place I've lived in my adult life is, is Ger Wiesbaden, Germany, right? And uh, when I returned here in 2017, I must tell you that... Um, when I arrived back in the United States, I don't think I felt as safe as I did in Germany. Right? I have 
now I have two adult children. I have a, a, a son, Hunter, um, who's an Air Force uh, cap, uh, lieutenant uh, currently in North Dakota. I have a daughter, um, 23, who lives in Trap, Maryland. And um, me not feeling safe really it it it, it caused con cause concern for me right now now that I have adult children when they're out there where I can't protect them um, it, it I, I want to make sure that everyone is safe right and and how do you do that right um, one I think you need to know where issues lie right. Um, you need to have communication with the community you're serving as well as with with the police department or the police force right I think you need to have the those um, those communication lines open and you focus on where the problems are um, and I think once you do that you can you can one prioritize those those needs and then secondly you know, work on providing solutions for for those issues. And I think that's that's going to be one of the key things um, that I could bring to the table. The last job I had in the Army was as an Inspector General. I served as the Chief of Inspections for U.S. Army Europe and, and Chief of Operations, where uh, my job was to go in to units um, and areas and kind of determine what kind of issues were going on, what, you know, um, whether they're having leadership issues, operational issues, um, personnel issues. You know, I, I have the experience of looking at that, um, at that higher level of systematic, systemic uh, issues and trying to solve them based off of, you know, whatever the, the issues are and providing those resources uh, to get after those things, um, I'm starting to ramble here. But uh, well, you know, what do I hope to accomplish as a member of this commission? Um, really, it's it's a well-trained, uh, respected, and confident police force where the community feels and knows they will always be treated fairly and with dignity and respect. I think that's. You know, everyone needs to be treated the same. How do you do that? I think it's by, you know, ensuring that that the police department in their actions, that there are certain standards, right, that that we hold people to. And I think one of the key things is making sure that wherever those 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 friction points are, wherever those issues are, you have metrics to um, to to keep people in check or find out where uh, where you know where we need to solve the problem um, and I think that is where um, that's that's what I would like to do and that's um, where I think I can uh, add the most value thank you very much for that response the final question for me and if we can limit the responses to two minutes I know it's hard uh, but I've got colleagues that like to ask questions and we've got a pretty pretty uh, packed day today um, but and we'll start with you, Mr. Uh, Lunassen. Uh, if appointed, how would you position this role to work on racial equity and social justice issues? So again, it, it goes back to communication with the community and the police department, right? One, um, you need to know uh, where the problems are, right? So you have to collect that data. Um, and, and figure out um, where the problems are and then again decide what priority and then have goals um, that the commission will will strive for right so if for instance um, we're looking at and I'll, I'll try to be brief um, you know ensuring that the police uh, you know the response time is 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 at a certain level right we need to focus on that or, or focus on making sure we have diversity on the police force right you, you need to have those metrics and and constantly look at um, what we need and where we're going wrong 
and then uh, you know focusing on it, maybe putting together uh, a working group um, to really get after it and, and based off of the guidance of this council, um, it fix the problem. Uh, I'm rambling, but that I think that's all. Thank you, no, that's very helpful. Uh, Ms. Deling? Oh, yeah. oh. There we go. Um, yes, so I think head on. So we have to admit and acknowledge that there is a problem. There's, there's this shyness in approaching racial inequality or social injustices. We don't want to say that there's racist police officers, but there are. However, we can have a force with racist police officers on the force. There's no way to weed that out. Um, and not have an indoctrinated policy that promotes racist behavior. Being able to have that real type of conversation, uh, reinventing the will is not always a bad thing. Thank goodness someone reinvented the will at some point. Otherwise, many of us would not have driven the vehicles we drove here today. Sometimes you have to say, yeah, you know what? It is broke, we need to fix it. Um, approaching it head on is really the only way to get past these things, talking around it, acting like it doesn't exist, not recognizing the problem. I mean, you can have an African-American police officer and still have that officer act in a racist way based on the policy he's operating under. So with that being said, the best way is to say, well, first, let's break it all the way apart. No one's going to check off on their psychological exam that they're racist. That's not going to happen. But when they walk into a police force that doesn't promote that behavior, that addresses that behavior, that speaks on that behavior, the outcomes are much different. Thank you. Thank you. The staff. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> well, first and foremost, I'd be laser fo focused on looking at data and outcomes. Um, whatever is available to the commission uh, in terms of data and further normalizing transparency, not in a punitive manner, but in a way where we can work together towards um, solution, solutions. Uh, I think transparency and data-driven interventions are key in identifying and ultimately addressing inequitable cultures, structures, and norms. Uh, based on the most recent use of force report, we're not there yet. Uh, as a community, we need to work with our law enforcement organizations, you know, truly partner to address these gaps systemically and sustainably. Um, using data is one thing I did as a member of the PBTSAC to better position the role of that committee. Um, I relentlessly urged the county executive and MCDOT to integrate equity in the planning for the county's Vision Zero plan uh, from the get-go. Um, highlighting this really, I think, helped, and I think it's something that could be done similarly in this realm. Um, in the policing realm, as I mentioned, the use of force report shows that black people accounted for 18% of the county residents in 2019, but 56% of the use of force incidents, 29% of traffic stops, and 12, only 12% 12 of the MCD sworn personnel. This statistic really brings us to workforce. Um, a diverse and representative workforce, especially when workers are engaged in, in, in the environment is inclusive, produces better outcomes, more just outcomes, and more equitable outcomes. Um, in my professional position, I'm part of a team of executives responsible for implementation of diversity, equity, and inclusion across a very expansive workforce. And while I don't want to really get into the details of that, in this public forum, I would engage some of the knowledge and expertise that I've gained there. Uh, professionally and work with other commission members to infuse it into appropriate county level um, recommendations and policies. Um, so last but certainly not least, I would engage the community in non-adversarial and proactive conversations. Again, drawing from my experience on the PBTSAC, this is something that I did there, and I felt that it was very successful. Um, in the non-COVID times, we spent half of our time out in the community. We went to underserved communities and we talked. And I think that that's something that um, needs to happen. There need to be you know, non-adversarial conversations about policies and structures that need to be put um, in place uh, here in our county to uh, prevent poor outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got Council Member Rice followed by Council Member Katz and then Council Member Jawando. Council Member Rice. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you to the three of you for offering to serve in this incredibly important role. Uh, Jerome Price, who was the person who's stepping down from the Police Advisory Commission, was actually asked by myself to apply for that. So I feel uh, some type of way in terms of uh, certainly ensuring that uh, the vision and thoughts that he had are certainly replicated when it comes to this uh, uh, Policing Advisory Commission. 
Let me just say that uh, him as a former teacher, I want to speak about him a little bit and what he stood for, and especially understanding the history uh, of this country, and you touched on it a bit, um, but also of this county, uh, of policing in general, all have incorporated uh, incredibly well into his analysis of where we need to go with our police department. But in addition, and this is where my question comes about, uh, his engagement with the community is tantamount. Even superseding data, which I agree is incredibly important, um, but those anecdotal stories uh, are the ones that truly drive what it is that we need to do and why we need to make change. Uh, and I know that his role in creating the Jaguar Scholars Program that uh, Councilmember Katz knows all too well, uh, as he and I both have been partnering with him in his efforts there to engage our communities of color and our young people in being more involved and engaged in our communities will help to create better outcomes. What is your plan and how do you intend on, and I heard you talk on this, Ms. Daphne, so I'll start with you. Um, what is your plan for engaging in those communities? Folks oftentimes talk about engaging communities, but um, it's very difficult work. Uh, Councilmember Navarro knows all too well about truly engaging those folks who aren't uh, the ones who typically we go to. Um, they're not gonna be at home when you knock on the door because they're working two jobs. Uh, and so what's your plan for engaging those communities of color, those lower socioeconomic status, and engaging them in what it is that they want to see uh, as a part of policing uh, here in Montgomery County. So I'll start with Ms. Daphnis. Sure, um, I think it, it starts with the meetings. I mean, this is a commission, it's based on a meeting structure and, and all of that. You can't sit in a conference room in Rockville and really be in touch with the community. You need to physically go out into the community, hold meetings in schools or other you know community institutions where people feel safe, where they have trust and feel heard. I think also really um, using some of the other structures that exist in engaging parents and families. And um, I think my experience with the Montgomery County Council of PTAs um, provides me with a, a unique ability to be able to do that. Um, you know, uh, there, there are PTAs at every school or nearly every school in this county. Um, and it is a good structure as a start to start to talk to teachers, to parents, to students, and to Board of Education members and others about things that need to be done on the other side of it. I found that in all of my work in the county on various issues, part of the barrier is just <laughs> talking amongst and collaborating amongst some of the, some of the institutions that exist. And, um, you know, I, I am not familiar or have not been engaged with the scholars program that you mentioned or some of those other specific programs, um, but I do think that um, those types of programs and that type of programming that directly reach our youth can be very, very important. Um, in my work at, uh, on the PBTSAC, I was very supportive of the uh, Vision Zero Youth Ambassadors Program, and I think you can use sort of similar types of, of um, entities in different fields to, to achieve some of that engagement and interaction that you're, you're looking for. But really, bottom line, meet people where they are. Can't do it from here in Rockville. Um, so thank you. Um, you know, I, I agree, meet people where they are. I think literally meet them where they are. I know being a part of the community is being engaged in the community, it trickles out ahead of professor in law school, Professor Lee, who said his drop in the pond. That's that's his vision. That's how he lived his life. A drop in a pond and it trickles out. And look, here I am. I'm part of his trickle. And so with that same respect, when a police officer walks into the same place that mom works at the local store, her second job, and can say, Hey, I saw Jimmy at the game last week, he's getting better, that's being part of the community. That's engaging with the community. Know who you're working with, who you're working for. We are all in this together. And so if I look at the police officer as part of my community, as part of where I live, as part of where I work, as part of where I play, this is no longer an adversary by nature. By nature. That means even if I find myself on the wrong side of the police, I know that person is still for my best interest. I, I know that because that person has become part of our community. 
So the engagement are, you know, definitely you want to have street festivals, you want to have organized meetings, you want to have dialogue and communication, and you also want to know that police officer's name. And you also want to, that police officer to know your name, to know your family, to know where your house is, and to feel safe with them knowing that, and to want them to know that. Um, engaging the community is going to take more than one action, one person, one, one community member. But if we all engage, hey, have you met officer so-and-so? You know, this is, this is something that trickles. I think Professor Lee had something going, so thank you. <clears throat> so I, I spent some time um, in New York City as a recruiting company commander where I uh, recruited people, um, in particular Queens, Jamaica Queens, Flushing Queens, to join the Army. And, and in order to, to do that, I had to build relationships um, with the community. I had to spend time, and as as uh, my counterparts have both said, right, it, it's it's a lot of hard work. To your point, Councilman Rice, right? Um, and I think you, you need to reach out at all the vet, all the different venues um, between uh, you know going to those barbecues, holding reoccurring uh, meetings with the community. You know, again, to meet them where they are to social media. You know, I'm 50 years old, I'm not a big social media guy, but, but you gotta go wh where, where um, the community is, right? So um, it just goes to understanding the needs of the community, being a part of the community. Again, that's part of the reason why I, I, I wanna be a part of this is because I, I live in Silver Spring, right? So I wanna make sure that the community uh, has what they need, they're treated with respect, <clears throat> and and um, you know the key is understanding where the problems and issues are, and you do that by building relationships. Again, meeting more pe people where they are, um, just being open to people communicating to the commission or me. Um, again, I, I talked about social media, uh, you know, face to face handshaking, and I'm sure all of you have had to, to do those things, but going where the population is um, and, and, you know, going where the, going where the problems are, right? If, if there is a certain issue, you know, uh, in, in a certain neighborhood, you know, met whether it's, uh, you know, too many people are getting arrested there. Okay, well, let's go down there. Let's, let's talk to those members. Let's, Let's let's knock some doors. Let's reach out. Let's via email or or whatever, um, and and really get down and dirty and and try to understand the needs of of the people we're trying to uh, assist. Thank you, uh, Chairman Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you all for for applying. This is an extremely important uh, commission, and, and you're doing an extremely good job in your answers. My question is, have you ever attended, or I guess attended is not even the right term anymore, have you virtually attended uh, a police advisory commission meeting? And if so, what were your observations of that meeting? And with, with that, I'll start with you, please, sir. Uh, no, sir, I, I have not. However, uh, when, when I did find out that I was going to be interviewing, I did uh, kind of look through the website and, and viewed the meeting notes. And I was um, happy to see, uh, you know, all the different uh, different pieces of legislation and policies and procedures that they're putting in place, um, you know, are, are trying to work on. So the answer is no, but um, yeah, no. <laughs> I appreciate that. Please. No, I have not. I will. Hopefully I'll be part of them as well in the future, but I have not as of yet. Okay, thank you. I have not attended one of the Police Advisory Commission meetings, but like Rudy, I did review many of the materials and have followed this, you know, relatively closely over the past several years, um, especially as these conversations have come up in other forums. Um, unfortunately, had some scheduling conflicts with many of the regularly scheduled times in the past. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. President. Thank you, Councilman Jawando. Thank you. Uh, and also, I want to thank you all for putting your names forward to 
willingness to serve. It's uh, really wonderful to hear how much you've thought about it. Um, I have the same question for each of you, and we'll, we'll start with you, Ms. Daphnis. Um, we're having a national discussion right now, and we've been having a discussion on the council about what is the proper role of law enforcement, right? Uh, sure. Whether you call it reimagining or uh, reform, whatever the term. Uh, I have a view, this isn't a trick question, I think we've asked our police to do too much. Uh, I think we've overburdened them with everything from traffic reports to extremely violent crime and everything in between, and that has had deleterious effects on them personally, their mental health and ability to do that job when they're not trained to do all those jobs, and uh, the community uh, as well, and, and disproportionate outcomes, some of which have been mentioned. I think we need to narrow the focus. Do you agree with that assessment? And, and if so, what do you think is the proper role for police in our community? And how does how can the commission, do you see that as the important work of the commission to help advise and define that for us? I absolutely agree with that, um, that assessment. Um, I have been very vocal in my other work about a desire to shift some functions from the police department to the Montgomery County Department of Transportation, for example, to um, reduce the number of potentially unnecessary traffic stops, um, especially when data came to light that some of those traffic stops may have been biased or, um, you know, not not really based on proper policy and I, that was a few years ago now but um, I think that as I mentioned throughout my testimony I believe that um, there are jobs in this community that need to be performed by people other than the police the, you know therapists mental health workers social workers social services agencies um, and we should be funding the police appropriately to do their job and funding those social services agencies and some of the other county agencies to do their jobs. And I think that it is an ongoing conversation and it does require additional discussion about how, um, how you really uh, both integrate police and their role into the community and do so appropriately in ways that are balanced, in ways that are fair, just, you know, <coughs> equitable and just. Um, Ultimately, I believe that our police department is here to keep us safe, and I think that they strive to do so, and I want to help enable them uh, to perform that mission. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, so police officers should, I, I mean, I want to go back to the original protect and serve. That's their role. That's what they are, that's what they're equipped to do. Um, to be a resource for the things that you have mentioned, where or social working ther therapist, or if they need EMTs, they're now put, like required to do the injections. All these arguments over things that they're not necessarily there to do from original, from start, from beginning. So while there are parts of things that need to be changed, other things protecting and serve should stay the same. That's what they should do. Be the resource for these other things that we are asking them to do is too much. It's too much for a person to bear. For one, and they're still people. The police officers are still individuals. As, if we talk about them as an entire entity, we forget that this is a one person encountering one situation at one moment on one day. And if we're asking them to have eight arms and be able to think of every bit of training that they've been mildly given from all the areas that they're required to know, because otherwise, if they don't address this mental health issue in the exact way that a social worker would, then they are in the wrong. That's actually not the way to stretch them. That, too much of anything is not a good thing. So if they know a little bit of everything but they're not specialized in anything, then our protecting and our serving has gone awry. Being a resource and saying this is a mental health issue, this is the resource that I'm going to call, this is how we reach the community and become one and work in, a, in an operable train type of situation. We all are working together, not asking one individual, one person, one police officer to know and do everything. Thank you. Thank you. So absolutely, I agree. Um, what our police officers are required to do um, is is quite a bit, right? Um, they are, in essence, you know, the first response for whatever incident that occurs for the county. Uh, to everyone else's point, 
it's not really about uh, whether you know the the police shouldn't protect and serve, but what other resources do those first responders need to have? Right? We talk about mental health training or whatever. You know, is the answer to um, provide that that whatever thirty minute hour one week training to the police officer? No, I don't think so. Right? What it takes is resources that the county would be willing to commit to to get those counselors, to get those mental health professionals out in the field to, to do those things, right? You, you can't ask for a 20-something, 30-something-year-old police officer to handle the community, and, 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 and you know, you're setting them up for success, or for failure, right? You're setting them up for failure. So what the council, and I think, the community at large needs to do is determine, um, you know, <clears throat> when someone is, when the, when the police is called, right, what do we expect them to do? What do we know about the situation that they're being called to, right? Those questions need to be asked, and we have to have the right resources to send out there. Right. If if you know that there is a domestic dispute, you know, there's someone naked in the street, you know, acting crazy. You're going to send an armed police officer there. Maybe maybe one of them. And then might you might have to send, you know, a team of mental health professionals. Right. But that takes resources, time and commitment from this council to do those things. And it takes public support. Right. You, you have these these chants of defund the police. Absolutely not. Right. It's it's fund the county services to, prov you know, to protect um, to protect our community. I mean, that's really what it is, whether it's a, a an armed police officer or a mental health professional or a social worker. Right. Those are all significant resources that I don't think the county has right now that they're able to dispatch, you know, when needed. Right. So so I think it takes priority from the council on what resources we want and you know what are the key things what are the basic uh, services or uh, subject matter experts that we need on the team to, you know to help the community I hope that answers your question sir it does thank you they're all great answers thank you thank you councilmember Navarro thank you so much and thank you all three of you for your service uh, and Ms. Daphne in particular for doing so much for our county and then stepping up in this particular space as well. Um, so, um, so, so, you know, as, as again, I'm about to leave the council and I'm just reflecting on everything. The truth is that this council has passed a number of pieces of legislation, but also has done a lot of work working with the administration to address this issue that you, sir, just, just uh, described. We, you know, we examine and study the CAHOOTS program. Um, we have actually put funding to make sure that we have that support. Um, so I feel like there's been quite a bit of work already done to us to put in place some of these components. Um, the expansion of wellness centers to all high schools was really important and it's part of this work. It's all comprehensive and it, it really does connect. So I hope that this, um, you know, that this group will also take a look at all of that because I believe that these are changes that are going to be positive um, moving forward, but they do need to be strengthened and need to be aligned. So that's going to be critical. Um, the only other thing I just wanted to touch upon because I didn't hear uh, discussed so much, and I'm just curious as to what you think. You know, in this debate, in this conversation, it's been it's been challenging because we we look at the data and we know that the disproportionality exists, and we know that we have to do a lot of work, and we have we've touched upon that. The flip side to that, and it goes to the community engagement, is that we are in a county that is, you know, over 33% immigrant, and I believe Councilmember Jawando shared this data point. I think first first gen, or probably then make us about 40 45% immigrant. And so, there are many communities within our county where actually uh, folks are victims of particular type of organized crime mostly gangs, et cetera, and they feel like they actually don't have any police protection and or will not share um, those concerns, you know, whenever they engage in any kind of meeting or anything of that nature. So just very briefly, just curious about, you know, when you talk about the community engagement, how will we be able to kind of balance that? Because, you know, as, as Daphne said, I'm also married to a black immigrant, have, you know, black daughters and 
always looked at the disproportionality trying to figure out how do we balance um, the provision of public safety in a county that is so complex and that has all of these different layers of, of uh, issues, right? That sometimes are contrary, but sometimes it's just a matter of figuring out how do we get everybody on the same page. So just curious about this piece around how in some communities, um, you know, they may not even be vocal, but there's a lot of that type of crime that does exist and, and we need to, to figure out how to address it. Staff, you can start. Um, so, as you all know, I live in um, Councilwoman Navarro's district in Wheaton. Um, my children go to Highland Elementary School. Highland Elementary School is a majority minority school with um, over 55% of the kids ESL uh, and 80% um, of the kids uh, free and reduced meals. A lot of like very um, problematic issues in terms of um, societal pressures um, and the communities that you mentioned, those who might be involved in gang activity or those who are fearful of the police because of their immigration status. Um, I've been on the board of the Highland PTA since my daughter was in kindergarten and we've had to navigate a lot of these issues. Uh, you know, we've, we've had to have conversations about, you know, going to get your COVID shot when someone might be scared that if they show up to an official government function, they might get deported. <laughs> These are things that my community, where I live, we've had to deal with. And I, and I think that those issues are very similar when you're looking at you know, the crime and, and safety um, realm. Uh, and I, I think it is challenging. Uh, I don't know that there's like one answer for how to, how to engage with various communities across the county, uh, I think it takes um, really looking at the specific communities and the cha unique challenges that they might face. I think young black men might face a different uh, set of challenges than, uh, than you know, our Latino youth um, or families. So I, as, a, as a commission member, I would be very mindful of that and very, um, sensitive to some of that dynamic, um, as I often am in many of the conversations in my own community. Thank you. Um, so for this, I, I believe that it would need to be a long end game. You, this is not a, a flip the switch and all of a sudden a community trusts you. Um, so if we're looking at finding a solution where we can have data and statistics that show proven results um, within a matter of months, that's not, that's, that's unlikely. Um, not impossible, anything's possible, but it's highly unlikely. So this would be in more so than a policy, an action plan. Um, something that involves the police and the community together in an action plan that takes place. Um, and we, the results may not be something you see for 10 years. It might not be something you see for 15 years. In order to get an entire community, um, especially in a community within a community within a community that may have organized crime as an overarching systematic issue within all of those communities, this is going to be something where I have had to have had a relationship with the police from birth. This would be something that has to go from that beginning, that early. And a lot of times we can find ourselves impatient because we want to see the change happen immediately because we want to see the relief in our community immediately. And, and so we have to hold our horses and be patient with an action plan in place because 10 years will get here whether we have an action plan in place or not. So let's put it in place, put, get the community involved, have a, have a plan where the police are reaching out to the younger generation of those immigrant families so that we have a relationship in place when they 16, 17, 18, it's established there. Thank you. So having a plan is spot on, right? Um, and I, I wrote a couple words and I, th I think I'll, I'll key on these. Uh, trust, visibility, communication and transparency, all right? And all of that takes a significant amount of work. Um, trust and visibility is, is making sure that the police department, the commission, or whatever, um, were accessible to, to the community, right? 
Um, and that's going to take time. That's going to take, again, reoccurring meetings, um, just being where the community is. And then w w when you have the plan of action based off whatever they issue, right, the key is, is to show, um, show the work that's being done, right? It might take 10 years. It might take five years. I don't know. But as we make uh, methodical changes, we need to, to communicate that with the community so they know we're just not sitting on our, on our hands, right? We need to communicate to them, make sure it's clear what we're trying to do, that we hear them, and we're, get, we're getting after it, right? Um, so, I, you know, it goes to making sure that, that um, if there is a problem stated, we say, yes, we understand it, and this is what we're going to do, and this is the progress that we're making. It, it's, it's about um, gaining their trust and being transparent, and I'll end with that. Thank you for those questions. Thank you for those answers. Uh, we appreciate all of your uh, willingness to serve, and um, we look forward to following up with, with each of you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, that moves us on to uh, the last item on the agenda before our uh, lunch recess, which is the consent calendar. Can I get a motion to accept the consent calendar? Moved by Councilmember Friedson, seconded by Councilmember Rice. Mr. President. Any discussion? Oh, Councilmember Jawando. Very briefly. Uh, just wanted to uh, thank, as I always try to do, because they do such great work, uh, OLO for their work uh, of the release of this report on item P, which given our last conversation is relevant in its analysis of uh, traffic violations in a data set, uh, builds on, on work that we have done on this council before, uh, and illuminates some significant challenges and disparities uh, in who is pulled over, who has issued tickets, uh, how many, uh, the, with deep disparities in our black and brown communities. And uh, I look forward to taking it up in public safety and working with the whole council to address these in the coming months and years. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor of the consent calendar, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Uh, colleagues, I uh, just remind everybody we have an important proclamation recognizing Breast Cancer Awareness Month presented by Councilman Navarro at 1 o'clock. And then we will uh, resume with public hearings at 1.30 as well. So with that, we are recessed until 1 o'clock. <laughs>